is now live virtually. Well, thank you and good morning, everyone. Welcome to the February 6, 2024 Urban Planning Committee meeting. Uh, we are meeting today on uh, the traditional territory of Treaty 6. Uh, from time, time immemorial, diverse Indigenous nations have stewarded these lands, including the Nehiwak, Nehewiniwak, Nakota Iska, Dene Salina, and Nititsapi. Many more First Nations, Métis, and Inuit peoples have gathered, traded, and celebrated on this land uh, for generations. This place also forms part of the Métis homeland. The signing of Treaty Number 6 in 1886-87 created a foundation of good relations, welcoming peoples to this area from around the world. Today, uh, in the city of Edmonton, we work to carry on this tradition of welcoming people from many nations as we continue to live into the spirit and intent of treaty. I'll start with a uh, I'll go now to a roll call of committee members. Councillor Tang. Hello, good morning. Good morning. Uh, Councillor Cartmel. Good morning. Good morning. Councillor Rutherford. Good morning. And Mayor Sohi. Good morning. Good morning. I see we're also joined by our colleagues, Councillor Rice. Good morning. Councillor Principe. Good morning. Councillor Wright. Good morning. Councillor Salvador. Good morning. And Councillor Knack. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, Councillor Tang, can I turn to you for the adoption of the agenda? Uh, yes, I move that we adopt the agenda for, for today, February 6, 2024. Thank you. Um, please vote. Just waiting on one vote. Councillor Rutherford. Oh, I voted in East Scribe on the yes. Thank you. We have all the votes. Please display the vote. And that's carried. Uh, Councillor Tang to the minutes. Uh, yes, I move to accept the minutes from the last time. Thank you. Any errors or omissions? Seeing none, please vote. We have all the votes. Please display the vote. And that's carried. Um, I'm not aware of any protocol items. So we will move on to selection of items for debate if my colleagues want to click on. Councillor Tang? Um, yes, I'll select, uh, I think, 6-1, 6-2, -one, and 7-1. -one. Actually, sorry, apologies, just 6-1. Just six one, okay. Uh, well, I, I will select six two and uh, seven one as well, uh, so that those are all of our items except for um, our request to reschedule. So, with without seeing anyone else on the board to select that item, I'll just ask that we vote on item five point one.
We have all the votes. Please display the vote. And that's carried. Next, we have um, requests to speak. I have that list in front of me if uh, that's easiest or if Councillor Tang has it. Sure, yeah, I can I can go ahead and move uh, that we hear from the following speakers. Uh, in panels when appropriate on 6-1, close and share streets in downtown. Sorry, Councillor um, oh, Yeah, we only need to do- oh, already, Okay, just 7-1, right? Yeah. Okay, perfect. Uh, direct downtown to airport bus route to Lexi McFarland. Great. Let's vote on that, please. We have all the votes. Please display the vote. And that's carried. Excellent. So we'll go first to um, a presentation from administration on 7-1 uh, before we hear from our speakers. Um, and I'll, I'll have a brief introduction once we get to our speakers, but for now, I'll turn it over to administration for your presentation. Councillor Stevenson, did you want to start with item 6-1 for unfinished business? Yes. Did I say yes? 6-1. Closed and shared streets in downtown. Thank you. All right. Good morning. Uh, my name is Kent Snyder. I'm branch manager of Plan Air Planning and Environment Services. And we're here to present findings from work completed to respond to the motion that administration engage with local stakeholders to develop an approach regarding closed, car-free, and shared streets in downtown to enhance vibrancy, active mode, safety, and business activity, and return with a report including a streamlined process for setting up temporary road closures to accommodate pedestrian and active modes. So we have a short presentation for committee to highlight our findings uh, in response to that motion. But before we commence, we want to acknowledge and celebrate that downtown has champions that are active and working in concert with the city. Our community and downtown benefits from these champions' passion and commitment. The Urban Development Institute and Paths for People hosted discussions with a group of downtown stakeholders, including the Downtown Recovery Coalition, the Downtown Business Association, and the Downtown Edmonton Community League in creating a community-driven downtown pedestrianization plan. Administration's report was informed by these key stakeholders and were encouraged that the findings between the two reports have the common goal of creating a more vibrant, pedestrian-friendly downtown. I will now ask Nathan Smith, Senior Engineer, uh, Mobility, to present the details of administration's report. Thank you, Kent. Next slide, please. Roadways are one of the public assets that the city manages to serve Edmontonians. While roadways are typically used to facilitate mobility, there are opportunities for alternative uses in some of these spaces to support vibrancy, business activity, safety, and active modes. These alternative uses can be applied both temporarily or permanently and take the form of car-free or shared streets. Next slide, please. Like the name suggests, car-free streets are roadways where motor vehicles are excluded to allow for other uses of the space. The area of the street typically reserved for vehicles is instead used for program activities, extension of business, or active transportation. Temporary car-free streets are common in downtown Edmonton when the streets are closed for various festivals, markets, and events. An example of a more permanent implementation of a car-free street would be portions of Stephen Avenue in Calgary, where vehicles are not permitted and the space is focused on accommodating pedestrians. Next slide, please. Unlike car-free streets, shared streets do permit vehicle traffic. However, vehicles do not have priority, and the space is designed to be open to all mobility users, including pedestrians and people cycling. Traffic calming measures like narrow lanes, curb extensions, and streetscaping improvements are used to both manage vehicle speeds and create an inviting space. Shared streets typically operate both as a public space and a multimodal link in the overall mobility network. Because infrastructure and interventions are required to ensure that shared streets operate safely and comfortably for all users, they are typically implemented on a permanent or longer term seasonal basis. The image shows an example of Bear Street in Banff, which was recently redesigned to operate as a shared street. Next slide, please. In conversations with downtown stakeholders, administration identified several characteristics that will support car free or shared streets in successfully supporting vibrancy. These characteristics include adjacent street fronting retail or land uses that help support pedestrian activity on the street, limited vehicular access points to reduce conflicts and travel disruptions, aesthetics and amenities that make the location attractive and functional, 
proximity to programmable space that further supports pedestrian activity, and the consideration of a broader mobility system and integration with travel networks for all modes. While these characteristics are generally beneficial, not all car-free or shared streets are the same. Different characteristics may be more or less important if the operation, operational change is temporary, permanent, and depending on what types of activity are envisioned on the street. Understanding these characteristics can help inform how to effectively support car-free and shared streets in Edmonton. Next slide, please. The city has a number of existing processes in place to enable operational changes, supporting alternative uses of roadway space. Temporary changes vary from festival and event closures, recurring market closures, and localized block parties in the Summer Street program. More permanent changes require considerations of bylaws like road closure bylaws or potential updates to the traffic bylaw and require some form of capital investment for retrofit. Next slide, please. Through assessing a streamlined process for setting up temporary road closures, administration identified opportunities that could mitigate some of the challenges identified with the existing processes. One is exploring an event permanent management software that would help streamline documentation, communication, and record keeping for event closure applications. Two is reviewing the traffic control materials used for temporary road closures to identify if there are opportunities for more aesthetically pleasing materials while still meeting regulatory requirements. Three is considering existing additional city-led closures. Four is a review of the traffic bylaw to identify opportunities to designate shared streets. Five is expanding existing programming to support implementation of adaptable shared streets, potentially on a seasonal basis. Next slide, please. Administration reviewed streets identified as potential opportunities by stakeholders viewed on the slide. While none of the locations clearly reflected all of the characteristics for a successful car-free or shared street, certain locations like 104th Street and Rice Hard Way showed the best alignment and were highlighted by many stakeholders as locations for further discussions. Stakeholders also emphasized that any location-specific operational change would require additional focused engagement. Next slide, please. The city has ongoing initiatives and plans focused on downtown, including the Capital City Downtown Plan and the Downtown Vibrancy Strategy. This work will enable the development of conditions downtown that will support the implementation of additional car-free and shared streets in the future. We will continue to investigate opportunities for additional temporary city-supported closures in priority areas such as Rice Howard Way and 104th Street. Administration is planning to begin a holistic planning exercise in the core area, including consideration of land use, mobility, and public investment priorities. Findings from both administration's work on car-free and shared streets and the work completed by external stakeholders will be integrated into that work. Next slide, please. And thank you. Uh, please have answer any questions. Thank you very much for that presentation. Uh, we're gonna go now to our speakers. Um, our very patient speakers, who I think this is the third rescheduling um, that they've had. So thank you so much for, for your uh, patience. I'll do a roll call briefly, but um, just for a highlight, if people are listening in for the first time or joining for the first time, our public speakers will be heard in panels. Each speaker will have five minutes to present. I will have the digital timer on the screen. Um, uh, if you're participating virtually, you may also want to have a timer of your own. Um, once everyone in your panel has had a chance to present, members of the committee will be able to ask you questions, so please don't go anywhere after you're done. Um, uh, just please remember to mute your microphone uh, as you're participating virtually and refrain from using the raised hand function as it creates issues of fairness and decorum. If you're experiencing any technical difficulties, you can reach out to the Office of the Clerk. Uh, so with that, I will go through our speakers list. Um, so first up, we have apologies. Uh, Jason Sfixte. Good morning. Hi, Jason. Um, Alex Ritsu. Good morning, Councillor. I just want to note, uh, Panita McBride and Cheryl Probert are not able to join us today. Oh, okay. Thank you for that note. Uh, we're sorry to miss them, um, but know that you will do ably. Uh, Shannon... Loner. Good morning. Good morning. Hi. Um, and Stephen Rates. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you all so much for joining us. And again, for your patience as this report has bounced around a few agendas. Um, happy to turn it over to you, Jason, for your first uh, presentation. You've got five minutes. 
Awesome, thank you. Uh, hello, members of Urban Planning Committee. My name is Jason Civic, I'm the Director of Metro Strategy and Advocacy for the Urban Development Institute Edmonton Metro, a not-for-profit organization that represents over 180 uh, real estate development companies, planners, architects, engineers who are building uh, the city uh, as well as throughout the region. I'm here to share our industry's perspectives on administration's reports, closed and shared streets in downtown. Let's do the time warp again. Uh, we're really glad to be here today. I want to first applaud administration for exploring the barriers and opportunities related to closed car-free and shared streets in downtown, with a particular emphasis on streamlined processes for setting up temporary road closures. While administration engaged our organizations, we believe this report does not consider the bigger picture. Following the 102 Avenue debate, there was a shared expectation from the community and downtown stakeholders, as well as uh, city council, that administration through this motion and report would facilitate a more holistic discussion around what is needed to fully pedestrianize the city's core and to develop a framework which outlines a hierarchy of streets and interventions. This report provides no recommendation, no clear timelines for implementation, and suggests doing more of the same. In a different context now, with our downtown, expecting a different result with our current set of city building tools is wishful thinking at best. And the biggest takeaway from the 102 Avenue debate is that if we focus on only a small stretch of the downtown or cherry pick one intervention over another without robust engagement from different stakeholders, we really lose sight of the bigger picture. And in the worst case scenario, we prompt a necessary division when we could instead fortify around solutions. Together, UDI Edmonton Metro, Pastor People, the Downtown Recovery Coalition, the Edmonton Downtown Business Association, and the Downtown Edmonton Community League set out to answer a bigger question. And that was, how do we create safe, accessible spaces that serve everyone in our city's core? The result of our collaboration and our research and engagement was nine strategic actions that explore how to improve uh, our built environment to strengthen the pedestrian experience. For us, these actions are the most important ones that we can tackle today, which will have the biggest impact and can be done without many resources, but rather through strategic integration and focus coordination between city departments, including urban planning and economy, as well as integrated infra infrastructure services. The real estate industry is particularly excited through this plan about the opportunity to create the best example of a shared street collaboratively with the city and community partners on Rice Howard Way, as well as 104 Street, to shape more accessible public and privately owned spaces throughout the downtown, to advocate for more consistent infrastructure and streetscaping improvements, and to explore more public private partnerships. As we know, the most important element of any plan is how we can implement it. And while administration reports identifies opportunities and ongoing initiatives, it's limited in the details around prioritization, assignment of key responsibilities within city administration, and clear timelines for implementation. How do we measure success when we have not clearly articulated and defined the benchmark or baseline? When we don't know where we want to go or where we are currently located, we end up in a state of analysis paralysis. And that circumstance does not serve our city or its residents well. We obviously have a clear goal of downtown vibrancy and economic attraction. And today is an opportunity to develop an implementation action plan for where, when, why, and how pedestrianization in the downtown can occur. In doing so, we can make clear to the private and community sectors the level of investment that will be made will be made by the city and invite them to be part of the solution. Between our groups and no doubt many others, including the city council and administration, there's an immense passion and excitement to working with one another to set our downtown up for success. Let's leverage this moment and think bigger. We are a city that wants to innovate, to be seen as a national leader in city building and mobility and we want to tackle the most complex and challenging tasks. In closing, I'd like to thank you for the chance to speak today. I'd like to urge council and administration to work with our organizations to address the gaps and opportunities outlined in this report, as well as uh, in our downtown pedestrianization plan. I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Great, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Sixe. Uh, next, um, Ms. Hurt Sue. Thanks everyone and, and thanks for, uh, it's great to be here today. So I'm Alex Fitzhugh, I chair the Downtown Recovery Coalition. 
Um, and I'm pleased to kind of build along, uh, alongside my colleagues' comments for this important report. So much of what I stated when this debate kicked off still remains true today. I think we're more aligned um, when it comes to city building and downtown, uh, building a downtown that's vibrant, accessible, and economically prosperous. And thus, I don't think the argument needs to be broken into pro-bike lane and walkability or against bike lane and walkability. From a downtown uh, mobility um, perspective, we fully support temporary permanent pedestrian improvements. However, projects like this do require robust engagement, transparent goals, and measurable metrics to track progress. At that time, none of this work had been done. Street closures do not work without sustained efforts on programming or street level activity that include activations from business to be successful. We see this with organized temporary closures like El Fresco or Winterval on 104th Street, where sustained programming efforts and contributions from local businesses justify the street closure and the investment of vibrancy dollars from the city. Our commitment to downtown and our passion to see vibrancy return to the street level led us to collaboratively working on this downtown pedestrianization plan, providing you and administration recommendations on much needed improvements across several different departments internally to bring this vision to life. It's our hope that we stop band-aiding this kind of work and truly embrace the potential ahead of us, creating a solid plan for people to walk and roll on the core, harmonized with snow and street cleaning, festivals, farmers markets, and more. You'll hear more from our core team who worked on this over the past six months, and we're eager to answer your questions. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next, we'll go to Shannon. I'll throw it over to you. Hello, good morning. Thanks for having me today. Uh, my name is Shannon Loner, and I am the chair of Paths for People. We are a nonprofit organization that's working to make Edmonton a more multimodal city and a friendlier place to get around by walking, rolling, gliding, or cycling. I'm pleased to speak with City Council in this capacity for the first time, and I look forward to continuing to work with you all in the future. I'm currently a student affairs professional in higher education with an interest in municipal development and community building. Our downtown pedestrianization report is a key example of the work our organization hopes to achieve in improving quality of life downtown for residents, visitors, and business owners. We all want to be able to work alongside a number of stakeholders, all with different interests, to come together and ensure that downtown is a healthy, vibrant, and prosperous space for individuals to visit and spend time in. Cause for People's focus is broad and covers all forms of active transportation. We have a specific focus on the pedestrian experience and want to ensure that people who are walking and rolling can easily and comfortably move around their city. We specifically want to shift perspectives on how we move around our city as Edmonton changes to align with the goals of the city plan, where Edmontonians aren't locked into car dependency. Instead, we can unlock the freedom of being able to choose how you travel through your community. The nine actions outlined in our downtown pedestrianization report provides the city of Edmonton with data-based community strategies on the importance of downtown development that supports a bright, vibrant place to be and that attracts people of all ages and backgrounds to the core. Paths for People will continue to expand on this work in the years to come. We plan to demonstrate the importance of collaborative relationships, downtown vibrancy, and promote a city that's built for the people who live in it rather than the cars that drive through it. City building is an ongoing process, and as the city prepares to welcome a million more residents, Paths for People knows that we need to prioritize building a transportation system that provides sustainable, safe, and community-supported transportation options. That work starts in the core, since it is the part of the city whose fabric most supports walkability, based on its density, mixing of uses, and community activation. We are committed to pushing forward this vision in a thoughtful and collaborative way for years to come. Personally, I've seen how downtown has shifted for my community over the last five years. Downtown has transformed and grown into a destination for festivals, local restaurants, live entertainment, and other community-supporting opportunities. As the community continues to change and grow, we believe the area should continue developing in a manner that encourages Edmontonians to visit and reside in the neighbourhood while also making it easy for people to move around in a safe and sustainable manner of their choosing. In order to continue building our downtown into a resilient core that fosters a sense of community, we need to ensure that the neighborhood is resilient, adaptable, and supportive of the city's overarching policy and planning goals. Thank you for your time today and in the future, I'm able to respond to any questions and remain committed to collaborating on these important topics going forward. Great, thank you very much. And finally, our last speaker, uh, Mr. Rakes, over to you. Uh, good morning, members of committee. Um, 
I am also here speaking on behalf of Paths for People, uh, an organization that I've been a part of over the last six years and acted as chair from 2020 to 2023. And on my front, I really helped spearhead this initiative alongside the rest of the organizations here today. And so it's important to acknowledge that over the path, over Paths for People's history, we have consistently advocated for a better downtown to walk, roll, or bike through whether that's advocating for a minimum bike grid back in 2017 or running various iterations of open streets programming over the past few years. Now, another idea of ours that did not necessarily achieve success is part of the reason that we're all here today. Though pedestrianization of 102 Ave is not something that we were able to push forward in the short term, Paths for People uh, knows that we can turn the conflict that's centered around that discussion into something more productive. And I think we're beginning to see the fruits of that labor in these reports and some of the actions that we can take today. No matter what side of the issue that you were on, as all the speakers are acknowledging up to this point, we all agree that Edmontonians deserve a more walkable downtown. The downtown pedestrianization plan that we developed demonstrates that the community is on board to implement this vision for a friendlier downtown to get around by walking, rolling, or biking. Many days of our spring, summer, or fall this past year were filled with direct engagement with community members, developers, and administration, creating the foundation for the actions we've outlined in this plan. We were out literally on the streets, in parks, talking to people one-on-one, -on -one, meeting in buildings downtown and walking between locations. And we really cultivated a good amount of feedback and I think reflected what people hope to see and how we can begin to achieve some of that. Um, I, in light of all that positivity, I think it's still important to acknowledge that um, we don't necessarily agree on everything and the plan acknowledges that there are some areas of diverging opinion regarding our downtown. Um, even members within the Paths for People community of advocates um, across the city have reached out and shared that sometimes they're hesitant to see us working alongside organizations that we had disagreed with in the past. Now, these tensions, I believe, really strongly should not divide us, though, especially when there is so much that we can agree on and push forward. And especially in a world that's increasingly polarized, we should make an effort to collaborate on ideas where we can agree. And everybody walks or rolls a little bit within downtown at least, whether their you know, main mode of transportation is walking or rolling or whether they're driving, taking transit or biking, everybody has a little bit of a walk or roll in their downtown. And so we should try to make that um, the best experience possible because that uplifts everybody. The concept of walkability is a really fertile ground to plant ideas um, for the future of our downtown. And we're hoping to see that grow and become something great through continuing to push forward this work. Um, we're excited to see some of the smaller, more tactical ideas that administration has identified regarding pedestrianizations take effect in the coming years. And we really need to ensure that these kinds of smaller ideas that are easier to implement are enthusiastically pushed forward across different departments within administration uh, and not necessarily just the policy wants, but everybody. Um, and we also really, really need to think strategically in the longer term and uh, set up um, longer term focuses on stitching together different locations like 104th Street, 108th Street and Rice Howard Way so that we can have that more cohesive downtown that's easier to walk between destinations and roll between locations. Um, and so with that, I'll just thank you for your time today and for participating in this longer term discussion as well. And uh, we're here to respond to any questions and, of course, remain open to collaborating going forward. Great. Thank you so much. And thank you to all of our speakers for joining us today. Um, I'll ask my colleagues to sign up if they have any questions that they'd like to put towards the panel. Thanks, Councillor Tang. Over to you. Great, thank you so much, Councillor Stevenson. Uh, thank you all for your patience. And um, uh, as the, this uh, report gets laid over, and I really appreciate your, your input. Um, perhaps I'll start with Pass for People. Uh, if I can start with you, Shannon. Um, thank you for 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 that presentation. I guess um, you know I you know this the the report that 
all of you have created is a is a product of you know your I think five organizations, each bringing your unique expertise and and lens. And I think I heard Stephen talk about some of the engagement you have done with your members. Um, but overall, it wasn't a widespread downtown engagement. And I guess, what do you see um, come moving forward? How, how do you see public opinion and engagement play a role in that? Um, one, some of the feedback I have heard as well is, well, we never saw any surveys or anything like this that's so widely available. Um, you know, how have they reached some of the residents? So I'm just wondering if you can comment on that. Yeah, absolutely. I think that the like scope of our survey was like primarily focused within the scope of our organizations as a whole, focused on the Password People Community, Downtown Community League, Edmonton Business or Downtown Business Association and UDI. And with that, like we are not all encompassing of downtown, you know. So I think it's important to recognize that like we can do this sort of focused advocacy or outreach within our specific groups. We can push it to a wider audience as much as we can. But ultimately, we're not going to reach everybody that may engage with downtown, move through downtown, work, et cetera. So with that, we need to focus on kind of these collaborative relationships to uh, work with the city on these types of like survey outreach or that sort of thing that has that bigger reach that can get more people involved um, and being able to develop those survey topics collaboratively so that like the perspectives of House for People and other in invested organizations are reflected within that survey then we can pull on the reach of the larger Edmonton community. Yeah, I, because uh, as you're speaking, my you know my mind kind of jogged to some of the other downtown projects where public opinion actually had a negative impact on some of some of them. You know, staying for the long term, and um, and I guess I guess what I'm trying to get as more sort of advice and kind of things to avoid, things like you know, things to that you would recommend. Um, but I guess maybe I'll just turn to Stephen quickly, because I think you alluded to this a little bit. Was this an unusual partnership for you? That's a good question. Um, I would say we, we've been an organization in existence since like the mid 2010s. And so we've always strive to engage with different partners across the city and I think uh, that is naturally skewed more towards like neighborhood oriented groups or uh, less on like industry or developers and more on like communities but um, you know that might be a distinction without a difference uh, kind of thing where you know developers and industry are part of building those communities that we then live within and so I think this was the opportunity for us to reach out and establish that kind of connection and um, push forward advocacy in a way that shapes all of our behavior and actions in a way that has that outcome of improving the end result of the community that we build and live within. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned that some folks did reach out to you kind of questioning why Pathful People is engaging in this partnership. Do you worry about those kind of sentiments that might perhaps diminish or, you know, have the risk of diminishing the credibility of this report? I'm just curious. Yes, I think it's it's all good to have, like I think we've learned through this, it's all good to have a bit of concern. It's all good to um, acknowledge those fears and try to respond to them. I think ultimately, like what really matters is like outcomes from this work and like things that we move forward with. And ultimately, I think everybody can get on board with the outcomes and just sometimes we're hesitant to approach the discussion because we don't necessarily... We, we feel like we might be, others may be bad faith actors, but I can tell you like our experience with it has been that it's it's been great. And I think if we can get an outcome in the coming months and years, it'll diffuse that broader concern within some of the community. That's great to hear. Yeah, outcomes focus. I will probably come around for a second round because I, I have some specific questions, but I will say I'm extremely heartened by all of you coming forward in a world that is, uh, you know, increasingly intensely polarized and 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 hostile and it feels like people who disagree can't work together. So, um, you know, your presentation collectively gives me a lot of hope. So thank you for being here. Great. Thank you, Councillor Tang, and thank you for those words. I'll go next to Mayor Sohi for questions. Yeah, and thank you so much. And also a, a gratitude to uh, UDI and uh, Paths for People for uh, working together. I think it's very important to forge those kind of uh, collaborations. Uh, so maybe I'll start with uh, any one of you from uh, both organizations. 
the report that you generated and what administration is uh, is proposing. Where do you see when it comes to downtown? When it specifically focused on downtown, where do you see some of the misalignments? Like, what are your concerns? Where do you see the that you uh, see that it's not uh, that you're not aligned? Yeah, thanks, Mayor Sophie. I'm happy to jump in and uh, also invite uh, uh, folks from Pastor People and Alex Wilitzer from Down from Recovery Coalition to hop in if I've missed anything. But I think, um, you know, as we know, reports cost time and money. Um, often when we see a report, it, there's like three or four months that often are, are sort of invested from administration um, to come before council and, and, and committees. And so in this particular regard, the, the report itself really focused on temporary street closures. Um, and so we know that pedestrianization isn't just about shutting down the street on a Friday or a Saturday. And should we use, we shouldn't be using data for just um, sort of these one-offs to sort of rationalize longer term permanent infrastructure changes like a, a permanent shared street. And so what was really missing was that technical analysis and that engagement, but we were heartened to see that administration um, has incorporated and integrated some potential locations for shared streets, but where we really come in is where we've been able to compromise and, and identify trade-offs. You know, city building is all about negotiation between different partners, uh, which includes community and different stakeholders, downtown and business owners, and those who are actively impacted by city building decisions. And so our report actually outlines uh, timelines, um, key uh, stakeholders who might want to be involved in that advocacy, and, and also sequenced um, interventions that could not only be utilized in the short term, but also could inform a longer term downtown capital city plan. But there might be some extra thoughts from the other folks around the room. Yeah, so as as others respond, I also want you to think about like what 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 are the next steps? What are the next steps you see in order to bring those different views more closure to each other, right? Where you know if uh, if administration is more focused on temporary state closures, you want to see more permanent and you want to more innovation and all that other right infrastructure. So maybe what is the next step from your perspective? I'll take the next stab at this. And I think when we're looking at, okay, how do we move forward out of this meeting and really start to uh, action some of this work? There is the short term actions that I think we really need to see across departments, uh, like across the whole city, like everybody who can lend a hand in this cause of uh, creating more accessible, fun, walkable spaces to uh, you know move through that should be a priority of every single like department uh, and they should be working together in a strategic way to like implement that. There's also that longer term discussion that uh, Jason noted at the end of his comment um, around a capital city downtown plan. And I think what's really important, especially from our perspective is like, we're going to have this shorter term intervention if we get that next step and we're going to start seeing really great hubs of activity let's start talking about stitching that all together all across downtown via you know avenues via alleyways via different um you know uh, public private kind of spaces um let's let's begin to really plan for that so that we have a more cohesive downtown right yes if i can see one so yeah. you, so you're seeing little segments here and there but it's not connected so you can start at one end of the downtown and walk to the other end of the downtown. Exactly. I think we will get the really great hubs of activity if we do the short-term stuff, but we need to start thinking about stitching things together because I don't think the capital city downtown plan really speaks to that cohesiveness between the smaller locations where we're fostering that vitality. Okay. okay. Thank you, Mayor Sohi. Uh, I'll go next. Um, thank you so much uh, again to all of our speakers for presentations today. Um, I think you've, you've outlined things really clearly. I think my, my key question, uh, maybe I'll go to Mr. Isfixe, would just be, you know, what would success look like? How, how do we know that we're achieving that sort of cross-departmental integration um, that, that you're asking for? Jason just sent us a message that his internet is temporarily down. All right. 
Well, happy for someone else to, to take that. I think um, some examples can include uh, like when we like when we have certain opportunities like the playoffs, which the Oilers are going to make and it's going to be epic or, you know, we have different festivals going in downtown. Um, you know, there's teams that are focused on creating great spaces in those locations. But I think success would look like those departments working with other departments or extending their capacity and talking about a, you know, setting up broader open streets connections between festivals or um, connecting ice district to one Oh fourth street, like, and having a broader network of open streets, like beginning to push forward that work beyond the little hobbles that we kind of departments may focus on uh, seeing that extend further out. Great. Well, you know, you've touched on something that I, you know, think think is a real opportunity in terms of sort of we have these festivals that are, are you know, Shannon, as you mentioned, very successful bringing people downtown, but we don't necessarily sort of the festivals don't have tendrils that that connect people to the rest of downtown. Um, so so uh, Mr. Ray, just in terms of your idea, would that sort of maybe look like sort of an off the shelf, um, you know, easy to do if festival organizers are there um, just saying, you know, either festival organizers or admin themselves could could bring forward those connection points between activity centers. I, th I think it would be admin pushing that forward, like leveling okay. up what the festivals are able to do, providing that support where the festival organizers are focused on their space. The city can level up their connection just as they do, like, you know, wayfinding for parking or hmm. um, that kind of thing. But I might pass it off to Alex really quick just to see if she has more thoughts here. Yeah, I think, thanks so much. Um, I'll just add, I think, you know, success really also looks like a really harmonized plan. I think what we're, what we witness right now in the core sometimes is a lot of prioritization of streets like 104th or Rice Howard Way in terms of beautification, but we don't see that spread across the entire core. So as you build out a pedestrian plan, what does snow removal look like? Mm -hmm. uh, what does cleanliness look like in the core? What is our infrastructure harmonization look like so we don't have 16 different types of garbage bins. Um, and I think this is really like important in building out an enjoyable downtown for everyone. Mm -hmm. um, really also impacts businesses at the street level, right? I think yeah. the harmonization of this stuff really does matter to the small business owners that are also hoping um, people either walk or roll into their business. And so um, I think where the gaps are coming from and what true success looks like is more of that harmonized plan across several different city departments um, to get us where we need to go in terms of really, truly pedestrianizing uh, the core. I really appreciate that. And I think, you know, in previous conversations, I think you've highlighted, um, well, and I think, I think other stakeholders have highlighted as well, the, the opportunity with the downtown ARP, for example, coming up with a uh, sort of a urban design master plan. And, um, you know, if I'm correct, am I remembering that, you know, one of the other functions that this can have is making it easier for, for private investors to um, take part in that. So they, they may have private space that's adjacent, you know, effectively public space or at least publicly accessible private space and the opportunities for them to invest in that and harmonize with the surrounding uh, industry. Yeah, I think there's a lot of eagerness from um, private industry and property owners to integrate better into the downtown design and plan. Um, I think, you know, a really good example of that is Rice Howard Way and Enbridge Center mm -hmm. um, and extending that into uh, fully to kind of the end of Rice Howard Way towards the West End would, would have been a beautiful option, but there wasn't a lot of collaboration at the time from the city for that. And I do know of a lot of property owners around, especially our table, that are interested in working more closely, mm -hmm. um, especially on things like lighting and, and further design elements that really create places where people want to spend more time on the, at the street level. And I think that's going to be really critical going forward, especially in, the, in downtown's 10-year revitalization plan. Great. Okay. Well, thank you so much. Really, again, appreciate all of your input and, and the work that you've done outside of this meeting as well and your plan. Uh, Councillor Salvador, over to you for questions. Yeah, thanks so much. Um, and thanks to all of our speakers for being here for uh, your collaboration up to this point. Uh, so I might just start with speaker rates. Um, you know, I... I'm really looking for that network effect, um, looking for that connectivity between hubs of activity. I know you spoke a little bit about that. Um, and I guess, yeah, looking looking for your thoughts on sort of where we're at now and the gap between 
today and where we actually need to get to in order to actually have that that connectivity um, and and a fully built out pedestrian network that that doesn't just let people spend time in excellent hubs of activity, but lets them travel uh, between those hubs and get to where they need to go. So thoughts on that. Um, and I'd also just add, you know, I'm not seeing an obvious north south connector or or east west connector. Uh, so thoughts on that piece? Yes, the, the I, I think current status is that there are those great little hubs, but there's not a, a cohesive or consistent broader set of network connections. Um, from a sidewalk perspective, I think we did that with the downtown bike grid, uh, like the minimum grid. We have at least sometimes kind of um, adjusted due to construction around Valley Line, but we have a pretty good network of downtown cycling infrastructure. And we would love to see that kind of expectation set for the sidewalk network so that as you go east-west along 103 Ave or 102 Ave, you're walking along a consistent high quality sidewalk that has programmable space, but also ample space for different, um, uh, different groups like people walking, people pushing strollers, people using wheelchairs, that there's ample space and it's comfortable to move through, move there. I, I don't think we're there yet, but that's where we would want to go is that same kind of mindset of let's have a, something cohesive and consistent across the whole downtown. And one thing that I'll flag is within the, the district plan um, for around the downtown core, like everything within the downtown core is identified as a, I think a prioritization area for pedestrian experience. And so like, if that's truly the case, then like a lot of resources and effort should be spent truly enhancing everything. But I think if everything's a priority within the, the downtown, then nothing becomes a priority. So I think some finer nuance around next steps around, okay, what corridor could be next um, for a strong east-west connection for in terms of sidewalk improvements would be really important. Because we saw last summer, I think two summers ago, like 103 Street, uh, 103 Avenue, sorry, being repaved in huge portions. And we just saw that as a huge missed opportunity where there could have been something co consistent um, thread along that whole street, and we didn't. And I think it's because we didn't have the higher level direction to point for that um, and maybe some funding set aside to, to do that kind of work. But that's what I would say is uh, it, you know, everything's a priority, it seems right now. And so we want to at least set some initial steps and that, that larger goal around having a more consistent um, sidewalk experience is uh, what we want to level up to. Yeah, that's that's really helpful. And just thinking thinking of those next steps, you know, what what do you think would be helpful um, helpful direction going forward from here? You know, I think uh, of course we have city administration's report. Um, we have the report that that you folks have produced as well. Uh, and and I'm looking to really grasp onto some tangible next steps, immediate term, <clears throat> as well as sort of those medium and longer term actions that we can uh, start looking forward to. Uh, so thoughts there around what next steps could look like? I think next steps would look like continued work between our groups and administration on some of those short term actions. Um, administration taking a cross-departmental approach to implementing this work and making it a priority for everybody across the board to be doing this. That's that's the short-term end of it. And then I think the long-term end of it is sorting out some of that longer-term connection work, um, you know, within a renewed capital downtown plan or something of that nature that, um, you know, while we're still cooking up the shorter term stuff, those shorter term wins, we're also setting ourselves up for longer term successes by stitching together these locations where we're, um, you know, making it a cool, fun place to be. But I would defer out to any other speaker if there's something um, that I'm missing there. Uh, yeah. Speakers fixate, I have 15 seconds. Anything to add? <laughs> I would just maybe uh, note that um, the info roadmap was a really good example of an administrative action plan that um, the administration uh, drove using different departments to drive different actions that sort of integrated um, different uh, teams to advance uh, infill and to advance like 
re the reduction of parking minimums. So um, I would just add to Stephen's point that we have really great lessons within city administration about these cross-departmental teams um, that help to sort of um, move and implement these actions forward uh, within a short period of time. So that action plan only served for two years and then it sort of, uh, all the lessons learned then were integrated into the city plan. So I would say that would be a good example of um, a next step forward. Thank great. you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Councillor Salvador. Councillor Tang? Yeah, great. Thank you. Uh, I guess just continuing on, on, on the thought on the thread of next steps, um, I guess first just on that network effect, um, with the Capital City downtown plan you had mentioned, or some of you have mentioned, do you see that as the next opportunity to, to kind of create some of those connective tissues among the various interventions? Maybe Jason? You know, uh, one of the ideas that we outlined in the action plan was something that was a little bit more visionary too. I, I think that city building in this city in Edmonton has been, you know, we're kind of at that place now where it's like, what's the next big idea? And I think Edmonton has been seen as a, a national leader when it comes to policies and relations. And uh, certainly we've done a lot of great work in that. And practicality is also of the top, top of mind given our fiscal realities. But one particular action that I think is really exciting that came from the development community is LRT entrances is really thinking about that that connection and integration between the at grade and below grade. Um, obviously, looking at how would we fund that is a big question, but at the, the baseline, trying to understand how our LRT system connects with our downtown and how people move. Um, there's a safety component, but there's also an element of design um, excellence that we can steward. So that's also a great opportunity. Another I, um, action that we listed in our PED plan was thinking about the um, role of the private sector um, in their privately owned public spaces integrating with the public realm. And we've seen great examples of that with things like the ICE district, uh, you know, the residential um, projects that are on the go right now, whether the parks or the shifts and how they integrate into the warehouse park. So that continued um, um, innovation uh, and, and supporting that without um, increasing barriers, whether it's through the policy or uh, processes um, and, and development approval processes would be one opportunity. Uh, and I would just re-echo that, um, you know, we can do the short-term actions at the same time as informing a longer-term plan. So I think ultimately all of our groups are really excited about this Capital City Downtown Plan update, um, which would hopefully scale up whatever we learn from our smaller interventions within the next two or three years. Mm -hmm. And then can you specify when you say short-term, what's the timeline that, that, that your group is kind of looking at? Yeah, in our plan, we list between two to two to five years. Uh, okay. Some of them are more immediate, like Rice Howard Way or 104th Street. And um, Alex might have a little bit more thoughts about that particular action. I know that that's already ongoing and there's a lot of excitement from the development industry and business community. So a lot yeah. of- these Yeah, and, and administration also mentioned that in their presentation as well. Um, wondering um, perhaps if someone can comment on the role you see yourselves playing moving forward. I've heard partnership. I've um, and I guess you know, like even leading up to this conversation, do you feel like you've been engaged as a sort of as a partnership in this conversation? And you know, what 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 could be better? What could be improved? That kind of stuff. Yeah, I would say that, you know, there's a lot of great opportunities. We haven't really explored a renewal of our public engagement charter. That's like a broader conversation, I think, as a city is like, how do we engage different stakeholders and not the most familiar suspects um, and, and organizations? And I think we we took it upon ourselves to, to bring together what we've been saying, foes to friends to city building lovers. Um, and so really leaning into um, trying to disagree and trying to lean into um, the dissension where we can to be able to compromise and trade off. You know, the Winter City strategy and the info roadmap are great examples that city admin led with private sector and community sectors where there are steering committees and advisory committees that regularly report and connect with administration on the progress to date. So whatever that comes out of today, we hope that it's immediately implemented. And it's not just another plan that lives on a shelf, but that we are constantly connecting with uh, public and private and community sectors. 
And then just finally, cross-departmental came up a lot. And I think you give some good example of the infill roadmap and that kind of stuff. And um, I'm, I'm also thinking of the downtown cleaning um, pilot that, that happened, maybe not cross-departmental, but cross-team. Um, and then you see that when you say strategic integration, that's the kind of the low resource intensive kind of approach um, where we don't, you know, it doesn't cost a lot of money, right? Just wondering if you want to expand on that in 15 seconds. Yes. Uh, well, you know, we've done a lot of great improvements on our zoning bylaw, which frees up a lot of staff potentially to look at other visionary ideas within the corporation. So we'd love to see a focused effort on how we deploy staff uh, in an integrated way. I saw Alex put up her video though, so maybe I'll pass it over to her. No, I just say the Center City Optimization um, team is a really good example of just cross-departmental integration in terms of really tackling some of the issues that are at the street level every single day downtown. So, Okay, I'm out of time. Thank you all very much for being here. Thank you. Uh, Mayor Sohi. No, I, I, I'm finding this conversation very interesting and, uh, and, and engaging. Uh, and, and thank you so much for, uh, for joining. Uh, I'm just kind of like when we talk about that, you know, stitching these different parts together, uh, I just want to get a sense about other cities' experiences. You know, when I think about Stephen Avenue in Calgary or Sparks Avenue in Ottawa or, uh, or Denver 16th Street Mall Avenue Street, that's a mile long, They're, they have features, some of the features that exist on those avenues that administration has identified five principles, right? But I think about Edmonton, what what street do you envision that has that kind of kind of is it contiguous ongoing stretch long enough for to create that uh, that that pedestrian experience? Or maybe stitching them together to create that kind of pedestrian experience. What opportunity do you think exists in Edmonton? Uh, I'm happy to hop on and see if there's any other partners who, that's a, I think it's a great question, Mayor Sohi, and you've alluded to some, some examples of car-free streets that have both positives uh, and benefits, and urban planners have talked about car-free streets for quite some time and the unintended consequences of them if they don't have the appropriate street conditions to warrant that vibrancy. And so commend administration for articulating what's needed, which is street front retail and and activity visitation you know we we all know that downtown residential and growing that is incredibly important so really thinking through um where is the existing destinations that people go to um and where are people living and where are people working uh, where are people visiting downtown and so rice hard way we've identified as one particular opportunity 104 street those we see in the immediate term but there's other opportunities that I think uh, we've been able to identify. 108 Street's a great opportunity that connects the uh, the legislature to mm -hmm. the, um, the universities. And I know that McEwen and Norquest are both examples of downtown revitalization catalysts that can really support that endeavor. Um, so there, those would be sort of some of the examples potentially that that could be explored. Mm -hmm. And you would suggest those would, for example, Rice Howard Way, 104 Street, 108 Street, so those should be prioritized in the in the short term. Yep, that's what we're articulating uh, in our report is Rice Hard Way and 104 Street as as great examples. And I think that um, uh, there is already interest from private sector and community sectors on Rice Hard Way. There, there's a lot of design ideas already percolating and and conversations with city administration. So I think really what we need to show, and we've seen this incrementally in the city. Um, and when it comes to city building is that when you have a great example, it, it's easy to scale up because you have that proof of product. Um, and so we let's let's put all of our eggs into places that we know can work, like White Avenue, we know is a great example, Race Howard Way, 104th Street, so that we can really demonstrate to different stakeholders that there's a, a lot of potential and possibility there. I think that there's a lot of... Um, there's a need for awareness on what a shared street actually is and how that functions. Likely will be some growing pains about how that actually operates and how people move through it. So um, uh, being aware that not everybody will understand how that works and you haven't really, if you haven't been to other cities across the nation and across the world. So um, Jasper, Jasper Avenue hasn't come into discussion. Is it, 
can you comment like why Jasper Avenue is not even uh, nobody nobody have mentioned Jasper Avenue so far? I think there's a recognition that Jasper Avenue is a core arterial and that there have been ongoing planning efforts with reimagine Jasper that'll improve uh, the infrastructure there. Um, but I, I I don't think it. Um, yeah, I it wasn't articulated as, oh, we should just open up Jasper Avenue to people and that's where we'll have the open streets. I, I think there mm -hmm. we recognize that there's competing transit and driving priorities. And okay. so um, we're glad to see that reimagine Jasper is something that the city okay. is investing in and see some of the improvements coming there. So you envision it differently. Okay, got it. Yeah. Okay, got it. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I don't see anyone else register for questions of our speakers. So I'll thank you once again for, for being here. Uh, you're of course welcome to stick around for the discussion, uh, but we'll move now to questions of our administration. So I'll wait for colleagues to sign up for that. Although uh, Councillor Tang, I know you selected this, so happy to go to you first. Yeah, sure. Um, if that's okay, I'd like to put the motion um, on the table. I, you know, this report has been discussed you know, quite significantly. Um, there's a lot of, you know, work in, in, in the background and considering it's been laid over a few times. I think I just would like to get that out there uh, from the start, um, hopefully to save some time. Um, uh, so uh, the administration developed an action plan to address the outstanding opportunities as outlined in the December 5th, 2023 UPE 01333 close and share streets in downtown report and actions in the community develop downtown pedestrianization plan um, and the following items. One, a sequencing of actions and the implementation schedule with budget and resource requirements. Two, metrics to inform ongoing monitoring and evaluation with regular reporting on progress. And three, connection and integration with the capital city downtown plan through engagement with key stakeholders in the community. And the due date is gonna be Q4, so it's a proper report coming back to urban planning committee. Um, and and uh, yeah, so this has been kind of in the works quite a bit. You know, I think there are uh, there are two parallel reports and conversations, and this is a way to merge um, and address some of the gaps and provide some clear um, expectations and directions. Um, you know, I uh, it's 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 somewhat uh, different from kind of the initial intent, and I'm I'm hoping uh, in my question, because I think right now it's just my intro to this, it's not my question uh, to administration. I'm hoping administration can 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 address. Um, the other thing too is that this is, you know, in terms of an action plan, I recognize that the fourth quarter is, is a ways away and there's a number of interventions that can be done in the near term, uh, both, you know, mentioned by the administration and in this community report. Um, and so part of I guess my expectation, and and and, and I, I want to, you know, hear from administration on their reaction to this is, um, you know, are there some low hanging fruit that can happen in the immediate term without waiting for an action plan to be in place um, that you can go ahead and get going on, um, including partnership conversations, et cetera, um, so that when you report back, not only will you have an action plan, you have some progress that you can share. Um, that is happening in the in the immediate term, um, so that's 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 the intent with this. Um, and I hope you know I, this has been in the works quite a bit, um, and in conversations with administration quite a bit. And and I hope you, this gives you um, that direction you need to kind of get going on some of this work. Um, again, I have more questions, uh, so I will just do. I I don't know if I come around or. No, no, I, that was your two-minute introduction of the motion, so thank you very much for putting that on the floor, and I will now set the clock for five minutes, and it's over to you for questions. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Um, so I guess two, uh, yeah, so two administration. Um, I'm curious a little bit about uh, your thoughts on, and a bit of a reaction to to some of the, the, the feedback mentioned um, by the group, in particular, that kind of cross departmental piece, um, can you can you mention that, or can you respond to that a bit? Oh, I guess. 
Oh, yeah, go ahead. You can't hear me? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Councillor Tang. Um, absolutely. Uh, we are committed to integration across the corporation, and certainly we've seen some demonstrated success um, with our downtown vibrancy work, working across the corporation to deliver on the outcomes of improving, you know, cleanliness and safety outcomes, and um, certainly the work that. Uh, we see happening in terms of the direction in this motion is to look at developing an action plan, um, but specifically, as you noted, to look for what we can do in the short term with existing resources. And we did hear that conversation or some highlights around the work that we're doing already engaging with industry on Rice Howard Way. So definitely um, excited and, and interested to sort of move forward with those next steps. I'll just maybe take the take a moment to expand that um, Nathan mentioned in the presentation that we are beginning a more holistic planning exercise in the downtown, considering land use, mobility, and, and public investment and priorities. And so this action plan, this pedestrian action plan, would be prioritized um, within that work. And uh, some of the other feedback we heard here this morning was around engagement and the more broad uh, more broad engagement that's needed and we'll certainly do that work when we do the holistic planning exercise as it relates to downtown. The intent really to validate and translate it into actions and build off the work that our community partners have done and so really excited about uh, the work and action that will be a result of this. Yeah, and I, and I think I just want to maybe thank you for that additional context. It's very helpful. Um, and so you know, while it's not explicit in this motion, but when we say cross-departmental, you know, I know I heard infrastructure mentioned, there's also elements of city operations. And so, you know, we don't need to get that granular with something like a motion, but I just want to make sure that's clear that when we kind of move forward, you know, the conversations across the corporation, right? Very clear. And um, certainly we're all here. Uh, representatives from other departments within the city of administration are here uh, to support and shepherd this work moving forward. That's great. Um, I see Tom wanted to jump in. Did you want to jump in? <laughs> yeah, thanks, Councillor. Uh, Tom Gervin, Director of Downtown Vibrancy. Just wanted to reiterate um, that my work centers around uh, collaboration across mm -hmm. departments, along with engagement with key stakeholders downtown. And we've had really great successes on, on multiple fronts. Uh, one project in particular, city, uh, Center City Optimization, in terms of enhanced cleaning, a great example um, that Ms. Ritsu uh, mentioned. That yeah. work continues um, with, with ur urgency um, you, you know, every day. And we, we have plans in place for, um, for this spring and summer. So that yeah. work will continue while we work on um, this action plan. Thank you. So, so directed. And then I also just want to make sure too that um, when we talk about resourcing for this, do you see some of that those immediate conversations around, let's say, Rice Howard 104? That can happen now. Um, but then some of the longer term stuff, perhaps there's an opportunity, whether during SOBA or during four, the next four year budget, because we're talking about you know, that time time frame is an, is that opportunity to kind of revisit that resourcing question? Because I recognize you can't, like, this can't just happen, you know, out of thin air, right? Correct, yeah. We'll continue to uh, deploy our current resources and, and have the resources in place to do the work plan for uh, the summer, and we'll revisit um, what resources are required for the longer term, if needed. Mm -hmm. um, oh, go ahead, please. I was just going to add that our report that comes back in Q4 would identify those opportunities for resourcing and budget needs, um, given what we prioritize. Okay. And then um, I was, you know, I, I, I don't, without getting into too much of the details, so some of the things I have heard are those couple streets kind of prioritized for the media term. Are there others that you think could be action now? Or so we're, take yeah, we're, um, we're embarking. So one specific one is uh, the full closure of 100th Street between 103 Ave and 102nd Ave, which will be piloted during Case of Edmonton. Um, so that's in July. Uh, that's a project that is happening. Um, Nicole Poirier is on the line if she wants to. Uh, it's okay. I'm, I'm out of time. We can come. Yeah. come around. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Tang. Mayor Sobe? Yeah, so let me follow up on that. Uh, so come summer what difference would people notice on the Rice Howard Way or 10th Street, 104th Street? 
you know, we're currently, for, for Rice Harvard Way, we're currently engaging with the businesses and the public um, on a project that would see uh, a, a full closure to vehicular traffic on the weekend. Um, and that's something that we're, again, continuing to engage on with the public, um, but are working towards implementation this summer. Mm -hmm. Okay, so on the weekends, closing it to uh, it to, in, uh, to to the traffic, uh, and how about one hundred four Street? I just want to know, like uh, the 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 work you that you will do to operationalize some of the ideas that you have uh, put together in the report, and what do you have heard from other stakeholders? Yeah, for sure. So in addition to Rice Howard Way, we're uh, concurrently exploring options uh, for. Uh, at least partial street closure in terms of uh, time of day um, on on Saturdays on 104th Street, um, potentially for the uh, a return of some sort of market style activation. So those those projects in particular, along with the one I mentioned for Taste of Edmonton, are, are three specific projects that are ongoing with uh, intention to be implemented uh, this spring and summer. Mm -hmm. And you heard. Uh, answer to my questions from um, UDI and Vox for, uh, Pass for People about you know, the focus of our administration is more on temporary closures instead of permanent closures. Uh, 99th Street comes into mind in front of Winspear uh, by, uh, by, the, by the Churchill during summertime, very busy festivals and everything else that is going on not as much during winter, obviously. Uh, why would we not look at closing that permanently during summer? Yes, and we, nice, we nice. turn it into a, uh, into a food, food truck avenue or street, right? So uh, there's, there's arts district there. Uh, there's not as much street front, absolutely, I get that, and not much as much residential. But there are other features in that area, uh, concentration of workers and uh, arts, arts and uh, and culture. Yeah, so specifically for 99th Street, uh, Mayor, there's a streetscape project that's ongoing. So in terms of any type of closure of that area in particular in the short term uh, isn't possible. As mentioned, um, we're closing, uh, there'll be a full closure of 100th Street um, to accommodate some of that uh, activity that we normally saw on 99th Street. So. We're excited to endeavor, embark on that, and um, you know, implement the the findings potentially long term. Okay, got it. Got it. So on the on the stitching of these different nodes together, uh, I think that is very important. I know it's long term, but it, to create that experience when people come downtown, that they can actually walk and uh, and connect by walk through walking to different parts of the of of the city and that is missing quite a bit in our city um and nodes are small uh what is what is the plan what is the plan to connect these nodes <laughs> So, um, Councillor or Mayor Sohi, the the in combination with what we've talked about of, of having some quick action um, this summer and over the next couple of years, that longer term strategy piece, we are intending to look at the the downtown plan um, to refresh it, review it, make sure it is um, uh, still valid and appropriate. And I think the stitching component can can be worked into that um, longer strategy as well. Um, especially looking and thinking that um, we do have, like downtown is meant to be walkable. So all of our policies right now say that this is a, a walkable community, future long-term, every block, every street should be feel comfortable and walkable, but understanding that as our nodes grow, we do need to stitch them together. So that work will be part of the strategy refresh to see opportunities where we can um, activate areas between nodes that are growing. Well, can we all come back? I really want to dig into uh, into the walkability, whether we are, how walkable are we are in downtown. Right? So maybe I'll come back yeah, if no, those questions aren't ask, uh, asked. Okay, thank, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Stevenson. Thank you, Mayor Silky. Uh, well, you know, I'll maybe pick up from there. So, you know, really appreciate the, the report and the work that went into it. Um, you know, I think there's a lot of strengths with the, the principles that were identified, but 
One thing that, that struck me was that uh, we don't speak much about the potential of routes to be connecting activity nodes. So I think a lot about, we've talked about how, you know, Churchill Square brings a lot of folks, uh, you know, to that specific area of, of the downtown, but not necessarily sort of how we connect from that activity node to, to Rice Howard Way, for example, um, or, you know, to 104th and maybe the new Beaver Hills Park. So just wondering how we can better... Well, maybe more immediately, how can we better capture some of that festival um, traffic, people traffic, uh, and help spread it out into the downtown through potential uh, temporary closures of, of streets? Yeah, I mean, immediately with Rice Howard Way, you know, we're optimistic that uh, a, a closure in that space would um, integrate well into our, our festival season. And we'll find, you know, ways from a placemaking perspective uh, and from a promotion perspective to encourage that walkability where we can. Um, as mentioned, the, the full closure on 100th Street can support that. Um, and I think that, that that's one uh, area in particular. Um, you know, 102nd Ave continues to be, you know, a, a a uh, well-shared street that provides access into Rice Howard Way in multiple ways. So I'm confident that we'll be able to uh, encourage that connection uh, in a meaningful way. Um, and in terms of the longer term um, ability to do so, I think, as we mentioned, as we revisit the priorities holistically, uh, we're better able to comment about what actions we can take place and what resources would be required in order to accomplish that. Okay. So, Tell me, remind me again, so 100th Street, the, the proposed closure, is that, uh, which avenues is that between? Yeah, it's, uh, I'll, uh, I'll ask Nicole Poirier um, from our civic events team to give you a bit more detail in terms of that closure. Hi, Councillor. Um, yes, we're proposing between uh, 102 Avenue and one, Tom, remind me, sorry, I just don't have the, that's okay. One, yeah, 103, 102. 103 and 102 F. Yeah, 103 yeah. and 102 F. Okay. So so that's really exciting. And I, I think that, you know, having some of the activities spill out onto the, a portion of that street uh, this past summer was really was really positive. Um, again, though, I just wonder about that that connection down to Rice Howard Way, for example. Um, have, has there been any consideration of, of closing off just that one section of 102nd Ave to just help that, well, I'm assuming that the, the train will need to continue running there. So I guess it would be north of that. Anyway, how, how could we get people from Churchill Square to Rice Howard Way during festival season, for example? Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. The LRT is one of the uh, safety things that we do need to consider. And so closing beyond 103 Ave is not going to be possible. Uh, but encouraging through signage and with programming, perhaps us working with the festivals mm -hmm. to see if there's a way to continue to animate down the street or perhaps having some of the components of the Taste of Edmonton happening on Rice Howard Way mm -hmm. in discussion absolutely with the uh, industry partners who are already there. But that is something that growth of the festival is something we're trying to consider and look at and find new and creative ways to work with the festival and all of downtown to figure out what is possible. Uh, it's not really administrations to do. We do work and rely on the festival to consider that. Uh, as the festivals expand as well, we have, I mean, those are, there are costs as it relates to that from their security to their um, mm -hmm. activations and animations. So that all goes into consideration as well. Yeah, well, I think that really hits on, you know, what I heard from speakers just now when I was asking them about their expectations. And, and what I heard from them is that, you know, their hope would be that the city would be driving that work, would be driving the, the closed streets and those those connections and the activity hubs. Um, but it sounds like that's uh, that's a different understanding in terms of how we're approaching it. So just wondering where, well, maybe I'll come around uh, to, to dig into that, but just wondering again, maybe what role what the city can do proactively to to support some of that work but yeah, we're, um, quickly we're we're leading the work to explore closing those streets okay, and we great. will we will we will do everything we can to encourage people to find it to access it to um, animate it in, in collaboration with partners but we are definitely leading that work great excellent to hear thank you so much for that uh councillor salvador 
Yeah, thanks so much. Um, just to follow up with some of the questions around connectivity and, and really that network effect to connect um, activity hubs. So maybe maybe just to start, how how was that sort of broader connectivity network effect uh, considered as part of this report? Or was, was it assumed that that would be subsequent work? Um, thoughts on that? Yeah, so the, the locations identified with this report were specific locations that we heard from stakeholders that they thought there were some opportunities um, that might align with um, some of the factors that we considered. So the thought with stitching things together was generally looking forward to this, this more future strategic work so that we're making sure that we're considering all the different factors. We're not just talking about the mobility network. We're looking at what are we looking for and expecting with land use downtown and how do we make sure that when we're stitching things together that all of those things are considered and it all works seamlessly. Okay, okay. And um, I'm hearing that that would be part of what what exact body of work capital city downtown plan like where where would that be housed the stitching work if you will yeah that would definitely um be housed within that that plan refresh um uh, looking at the priorities holistically downtown okay okay and you know just thinking one of our speakers used um like the, the bike network in our downtown as a really good example of um, how connectivity was considered, ensuring that there's clear north-south connectors, uh, east-west connectors. Um, would the same type of approach be applied to, um, to this work? Yeah, I, I, I think it's safe to say that we'll explore, you know, all options to, you know, develop a, a great downtown to continue to working on, uh, you know, a, a vibrant downtown. And previous work will serve as an example where appropriate. Okay, um, and then I'm just going to ask a question about the direction that's provided in this motion. Um, so when I read, yeah, the the action plan with really clear sequencing, implementation schedule, budget, etc. Also referencing some of the things we heard from our speakers about uh, the infill roadmap as an example. I think that was um, a really, really fantastic um, case study of sort of inter interdepartmental collaboration, um, being able to have clear lines of sight to uh, next steps, stages, phases. Um, is that what we can expect with, with the direction that's provided here in developing that action plan? Councillor Salvador, absolutely. Um, this holistic planning work that we're doing as it relates to downtown will be integrated. It will consider land use, mobility, looking at where we want to focus public investment priorities. And all of that will, uh, the intent there is sort of to come together in a really clear prioritized action plan for investment downtown. Okay, and then just final question, how does that intertwine with district planning? So yes, district planning is capturing, as we know, the first version of district plans um, are capturing and elevating and translating the city plan to the statutory plans that are in place um, and making sure there's alignment. And so that's the first version of district planning. But any of the strategy, future strategy work that we've been discussing can be embedded. That might be a nice home um, that can be embedded within district plans to make sure that we're taking a little bit broader look at how this particular district is connecting to other Others, um, and as well, um, more specifically internally too. So yes, there will be connections. Great, thanks so much. Thank you, Councillor Salvador. Uh, Councillor Tang, back to you. Great, thank you so much. Um, and then so just if I can clarify then, um, on Councillor Salvador's question around some of those past work. Um, I guess um, the question I had too was more around kind of the partnership approach structure, you know, not to dictate like you, you must have a stakeholder advisory group or whatever, but what you kind of look at some of those best practices of um, not just engagement, but working in partnership. Yeah, we've worked in partnership with multiple organizations um, through implementing the downtown vibrancy strategy since okay. its inception, that work continues. Um, and it's not definitely not from an engagement perspective, more from a partnership perspective. So you have um, some of that structure that you can build off of as well. Yeah. That's yeah. not too different from kind of those other projects that was mentioned, right? Cor correct. 
Yeah, and I imagine as you move forward, there will be um, there will be enga- engagement with members of the public. And one thing I was wondering, would you consider? And I'm sorry if it's a bit granular, but you know, I think about different users of you know downtown streets, and um, you know, we've we've heard from businesses, we've heard from you know those who roll, those who cycle, those who commute, uh, the, but also residents. But I'm wondering, would you consider doing things like personas, for example, um, young families, uh, you know, uh, for for people households, and and how they might interact with some of these close and share streets. You know, you know, we see our downtown as, as an, an inclusive downtown. It's a downtown for all. Um, our engagement does not center exclusively on uh, p- potentially businesses downtown or residents of downtown. It is broad-based. Um, that engagement in particular for the Rice Howard Way closure is ongoing and encompasses all the groups that you mentioned. Mm-hmm. And we'll continue to take a very broad approach to engagement, um, focusing on both an inclusive downtown and being representative of those that, that see themselves in it. Which we hope yeah. is everyone. Yeah, I guess the, I guess the kind of the the strategy I'm suggesting also kind of you know think about the personas of those with accessibility needs and how they might interact with some of these uh, and are you know and as we test out kind of these streets when they're closed and uh, how my different people experience. I think that's kind of the that experience is what I'm trying to get at, um, and I hope that will be part of the the conversations. It definitely will be. Um, and then, uh, can I just clarify, you know, as you move forward with something like this, will there be integration with, say, the bike plan at all, or even work with the Arts Council? I'm thinking they do so much animation and placemaking, and, and those are, act, um, and beyond just festivals, right? Like, uh, and and I I do see some of those actions highlighted, at least in the, in the community report. Um, will they, will some of those plans and groups be part of the conversation? Uh, Definitely. I can assure you that a coordinated and integrated approach, both cross-departmentally, but also with community stakeholders with a vested interest in downtown, um, will be part of the work moving forward. That continues to be the case um, during our current uh, iteration of implementation, and there's no plans to change that. Okay, great. Thank you. Just want to Make sure I get that point across. Um, and then the other thing, um, um, this is a very small but granular. Uh, uh, in the report, there's a number of actions and one of them was exploring like a permitting software. So a bit of a red tape reduction exercise, I'm assuming when it comes to festival organizers. Um, you know, I'm thinking urban planning, for example, has done so much around um, reducing the red tape on the development and uh, permit side of things. and you know, is there an opportunity to kind of automate with, and is that, is that, for example, like another near-term things that could just happen within existing resources? I'm curious. Uh, I'll take that one, Councillor Tang. Yeah, definitely Civic Events and Festivals is looking into various software programs. We're currently building our requirements document in order to better understand how we can more effectively and efficiently take in the applications get the information out to the various civic services and that each of the event producers can at any point during the process uh, from application to permission to activation, see where they're at in the process, what requirements they still are uh, needed to provide. And that will allow more integration with our incredibly integrated currently civic events implementation team and civic events management teams. Excellent, thank you so much. Thank you, Councillor Tang. Mayor Sohi? Yeah, thank you so much. I just want to follow up on, uh, do we know people's perceptions, Edmontonians' perceptions about downtown being a walkable downtown? People come to downtown for work, they come to do business, and they come to attend festivals, right? And uh, so a lot of people do come downtown, but I just want to know if people do come downtown for a stroll on the street as they would do for White Avenue or 124 Street. Uh, well, perhaps, uh, 
perhaps Councillor Sophie, I can take that one as well. I do know with all of the activations and animations that we have been uh, conducting in Sir Winston Churchill Square, along with the Edmonton Arts Council, with the skating rink, as well as what's happening in the Ice District, there are people that do call uh, downtown a destination and come and see some of those activations and those animations. Uh, so I would, I would suggest that, yes, that is happening, but I'll uh, pass it over to Tom as well. Yeah, so people, I, I I appreciate that. I think a lot of people do come down, down for they come for specific uh, uh, attraction, like right? they come for, you know, Taste of Edmonton or, uh, you know, they come for Carrie West, they come for other festivals, right? But do they come downtown, say, okay, I'm going to go downtown, spend my afternoon and walk around the streets and uh, window shop or just mingle among people, people watch, right? Uh, do we have that kind of attraction for the downtown? Yeah, I'd say we don't have a specific uh, a data point, uh, Mayor Sohi, but you know, we welcomed more festival and events last year than we did pre-pandemic mm -hmm. that encouraged uh, visitation. Yes. We've seen great success with the ICE district, a return of uh, visitors to the arts district. Um, and, you know, we, with that said, you know, feedback has been heard and we're actioning it that uh, improved options, um, you know, for a pedestrian experience, such as, you know, fuller partial street closures is an opportunity, which is why we're endeavoring on the work that we've, we've detailed. So we'll continue to explore those uh, possibilities, but I think that it's safe to say that there are uh, many Edmontonians and many visitors who enjoy a stroll around downtown. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, so just to put a follow up on Councillor Tank's question around working with the Edmonton Arts Council and multicultural organizations and other arts organizations. Uh, you know, I think that's a great opportunity to uh, bring more more life. Uh, and you've been doing that, absolutely. And I, I acknowledge and appreciate that. Uh, but having maybe, you know, if Churchill, sorry, sorry, if uh, Rice Howard Way will be closed, 104 Street will be closed, would we see more of a, you know, maybe jugglers or, you know, uh, other performers and uh, art dis arts displays and others uh, uh, activities around, the, around those nodes. Yeah, these closures would be accompanied by um, significant programming to support their, their vibrancy. Um, it, it would be done in tandem and definitely lean on uh, partners, including uh, organizations focused on the arts to help support that. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mayor Sohi. Uh, I just have a few last questions. Really encouraging to hear the, the sort of proactive approach the administration is taking. Um, the new software sounds really great as well. Just in terms of the back end of that, are we creating sort of an off-the-shelf road closure process for some of the streets that we know are closed on a frequent basis? So Rice Harbor Way, 104th Street, 99th. It just seems that, again, those are, those are streets we can anticipate will, will be closed for different events. So are we streamlining that process on our end? I don't know if uh, Ms. Poirier want to uh, tackle that. Yeah, so we definitely work with, uh, through the Civic Events Implementation Team, to streamline all decisions when it comes to any kind of road closures, whether they're temporary or permanent. If there are civic services required, we bring everybody into one room at one time in order to ensure that everybody is on the same page as we move forward with the activation or animation. So I think the process right now is quite streamlined in terms of how often they meet, where they meet, when they meet, and the topics they meet on. Um, the database for sure, or the new management system would be definitely helpful in terms of everybody able to look at one spot at one time and see where we're at with any one event or festival moving forward. Okay, well maybe just to dig into that a little bit further. So. I would assume that, um, let's say 104th Street, that's a road that's been closed for, for multiple different events. Do the, do the requirements of the different civic departments change significantly from one, one event to the next? Like, are there significant variables um, or, or is, it, is it fairly standard after a certain point? So we definitely rely on what we've done in the past to inform what we're going to do. However, each event and festival tends to be a little bit different. The infrastructure and the activations, the length of time, 
uh, whether they're over peak hours or whether they're just on a weekend. Those kinds of things all come into play when we're trying to make appropriate decisions about how to detour traffic, how to detour transit. Um, and of course, the permitting process to ensure that the infrastructure that is going in those places and spaces is ready for public to be in those spaces so that they can be safe uh, and, and well received. Okay, really interesting. Well, you know, potentially something to explore further when this report comes back. But, you know, my mind goes to just sort of, again, that that off-the-shelf closure, the off-the-shelf requirements that I think could could potentially help both, both applicants and administration. Because recognizing, again, if you are dealing with sort of like, you know, a million small variations on a theme, if we can help standardize that to say, hey, organizers, here are your options for what you need and maybe streamline some of their requirements as well. Um, presuming it doesn't overly constrict what they can uh, deliver, but just help simplify that process for all parties. I'd appreciate the work that's happening there. Um, maybe just quickly, my last couple of minutes. So the, the downtown uh, area redevelopment plan or the planning work that's happening there, are we, are we gonna be digging into some of the classifications of downtown streets. Um, so for example, I found it very interesting in the report that you know downtown streets can't have block parties because they're all considered, I think, arterial roads. Um, and I don't know that that's necessarily reflective of, of the character of a number of the streets downtown. So is that work gonna be undertaken as part of this work, uh, of the policy work? Hi, Councillor Stevenson, uh, Pavel Rosko, General Supervisor in Mobility. Um, yeah, there's going to be opportunities to look at some of these classifications as well as part of the transportation system bylaw update that we're also undertaking. Um, there's classifications currently in the downtown streetscape manual that we can also have a look at to see if they're reflective of where um, we want to go with uh, with these plans. But that's why we're also taking a, an approach of not just mobility, but also land use and open space. Mm -hmm. to see if there's, um, you know, any changes that would be required based on looking at all, all those three together. Okay, and then, so you mentioned the downtown streetscape manual. Um, so just wondering again, if that can be used as a tool, um, again, to help leverage some of that private investment to make it easier for businesses who may want to invest in the public realm and just sort of provide that standardization. Is, is that, will that be part of the work? Uh, I believe that was the goal of the uh, downtown streetscape manual so that everybody's kind of pulling from the same manual and ensuring there's a cohesiveness to downtown. Yeah. Uh, but again, like I said, we'll we'll relook at it and see if there's any updates that are required. But I think it's it's still a good tool to make sure that there's uh, that consistency um, across downtown, whether it's uh, public investment or whether it's private investment. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Councillor Rutherford. Yeah, thank you. Just, um, I guess, while we're talking about policy levers and it's coming up on the 14th of public spaces bylaw, I just wanted to ask um, uh, Ms. Petrin, in that development of the that bylaw, were you consulted in any levers or any things that we put in place there to help facilitate? Because I do know there's it talks about the closure of public spaces and the opening of public spaces. Um, and those kind of things. So I just wanted to know, is there any levers within that that we should be aware of? Um, Councillor Rutherford, I think um, the public spaces bylaw is a separate piece of work. However, how it's actioned and implemented in our downtown is important. Um, we will be looking when we do this holistic work around downtown to see, you know, how uh, shared streets or closed streets might be further managed um, as it relates to public places bylaw. Okay, so I'll just flag for administration that I'll probably have some questions on that for the 14th, um, because there is there is a lot in there about permitting and closures, and I think there is opportunity there. So just want to flag that, but also have that conversation at the appropriate meeting. Okay, thank you. That's all my questions. Thank you, Councillor Rutherford. I'm not seeing anyone else on the board, so I'll give it another moment. Um, but otherwise, we have a motion on the floor. I'll ask any of my colleagues who want to speak to that to, to please sign up. 
Uh, and maybe just as we're waiting, I'll start by saying, I you know, really appreciate uh, Councillor Tang bringing forward this motion. Um, I think it's it's a great way to move forward and also appreciate all the input from stakeholders that, that helps inform this motion as well. I've been encouraged by what I've heard from administration today, just in terms of uh, their commitment to taking, doing that proactive work uh, to, to helping spearhead some of this really exciting work to um, experiment and expand with our, uh, our connectivity in the downtown. So thank you so much again to everyone and again for our uh, public members for joining us today. I'm not seeing anyone else. So I will uh, turn to Councillor, oh, Mayor Sogi, happy to turn it to you. Very quickly, thank you to administration and also thank you to uh, members of the public, UDI and Paths for People and DRC for kind of working together, forging that collaboration. I think it is very important to highlight those kind of uh, examples. Uh, thank you to Councillor Tang as well for uh, bringing it forward. Uh, the comment I would make is that uh, even though the due date is uh, uh, fourth quarter 2024, uh, I would expect that the work will continue as uh, administration has told us uh, and look forward to some changes. Look forward to some changes uh, around uh, Rice Howard Way as well as 104 Street and other state areas. Hopefully that uh, we will see a mark different this summer for people to uh, people to enjoy these public spaces. Yeah, that's all. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Sogi. Councillor Tang to close. Great. Thank you very much, Councillor Stevenson. Um, and uh, also very much appreciate the downtown councillor's support uh, in this work. Uh, you know, after the 102 Avenue debate, you know, I've thought a lot about this conversation and how, um, you know, that stretch of road became an example of how it actually kind of in many ways pulled the community apart, even though everyone had a common vision um, for, 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 for downtown vibrancy, but different ideas for how to get there. Um, and so I very much appreciate a lot of the work that has been happening since then. Um, and that, that collaboration, like I mentioned earlier, is actually quite inspiring to see. And I hope, you know, this can serve as a template for how other very controversial topics where people can't actually come together uh, and focus on outcomes, focus on that common vision. Um, and we negotiate, we compromise, but we also land on concrete steps for moving forward together. And so, um, you know, and, and uh, you know, with this report, it's been kind of delayed for a couple months. And, and during that time, you know, I really appreciate the patience of administration um, as we iterate uh, this version of, of the motion and very much appreciate the input from, from those community stakeholders. Uh, something like closed and shared streets really is about tangible actions, uh, things that we can see and feel and hear and smell and, and, and all those things. And so those, um, you you know, I, I, I very much encourage, you know, what can be done in the near term to, to, to go ahead and do that. And then what we hope by the end, you know, in a year um, or at the end of the year is not just another plan waiting to be approved to be action, but, you know, there's some tangible progress made. Um, and, 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 and I want to acknowledge as well, I think since, uh, this report was first published and when the community pedestrianization plan was published, there also has been conversations between administration and some of these stakeholder groups. Uh, and I actually appreciate how administration also has responded to some of those feedback. And I hope what you are uh, in your conversations, um, you know, that we're all mutually inspired by, by what is happening here. Um, and then I guess uh, a couple points I, I, I do want to just um, maybe focus on is that that integrated and collaborative uh, without using the words cross de departmental approach, you know, I think we've seen lots of examples where um, we've seen some very positive outcomes. And, and you know, I hear that uh, this is very much the approach with downtown vibrancy, et cetera. Uh, and I just, you know, again, really want to hone in on that. Uh, without that integration, I think a lot of the things can actually come to fruition. Um, and then the other piece is around user experience. Um, you know, I, I think just 
I think a lot about the role of public engagement. And in fact, when I was thinking about this, um, I know that what the administration report outlines and the downtown pedestrianization plan outlines isn't going to satisfy everybody. You know, I think that's where that prioritization comes from. It, you know, it, it hinges on timeline, it hinges on resource, it hinges on like other things that's happening downtown. Um, but, you know, if I like a few years ago with the, the reimagined Jasper um, initiative, not the current version, but I remember the public feedback was so strong that it actually, you know, that some of the activation work actually ended, but it wasn't, it just ended and it wasn't so much about what can we do better? Or how can we iterate to the next version? Um, and so that's where I think actually having some of those, you know, prototypical users and kind of how people experience streets. Um, and if we can kind of think about different personas of folks with disabilities, folks um, with young families, uh, commuters, residents, also businesses, absolutely. And, um, you know, vulnerable populations, for example, like how might they experience these streets from different perspectives and take that into our planning consideration. Um, you know, I hope that we can see some of that discussion. Um, that goes, I think, beyond just public engagement. Uh, I think it really is about putting ourselves in other people's shoes. Uh, and that's something I would like to, uh, I will be looking for uh, when this report comes back. Um, and um, overall, just lots of appreciation for the work that has gone into this one. I think uh, it creates an avenue forward, merging uh, the things that we're hearing uh, between the two, uh, uh, you know, between the two efforts. And I'm sure there'll be many other voices and feedback that will come along as we move forward. And uh, and I, my hope is that it will only make uh, some of this work um, better. So thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Tang. Please vote. We have all the votes. Please display the vote. And that's carried. Thank you very much. Uh, that concludes item 6.1. So we'll move next to item 6.2, uh, which is commingling paratransit on and on-demand services. Uh, we do have a speaker, but we'll start with a, oh no, we don't have a speaker on this one. We'll just start with administration's presentation and then we'll have time for questions. So over to you. Thank you and good morning. Um, with me today is Carrie Houghton McDonald, the branch manager of ETS. We also have other others available online as well to help answer any questions that you might have. Uh, today we'll be presenting an information report responding to a council motion made in October of 2022 on exploring the concept of commingling paratransit and on-demand services. I'll pass it over to Carrie to share the presentation. Great, thank you. Uh, next slide, please. So commingling paratransit and on-demand service is a concept that's been around for a few years in transit. We conducted a jurisdictional scan to explore how this model was implemented in other transit agencies. We didn't find a similar large transit operation with similar service design and high ridership like Edmonton uh, implementing this approach. We have the largest on-demand transit program in Canada, and last November, we reached our 1 millionth ride in on-demand. So what is commingling? Overall, we found that there are generally three types of commingled service. So the first is commingled fleets, where paratransit and on-demand services share the same fleet of vehicles. In this case, a paratransit operator may be assigned to an on-demand transit vehicle to complete paratransit trips or vice versa. The second type is commingled operator shifts. So paratransit and on-demand services use the same fleet of vehicles and the same operator shifts. So for an example, an operator may complete both paratransit and on-demand transit trips with the same shift. However, paratransit and on-demand riders do not ride in the same vehicle at the same time. And then the third type is commingled trips where paratransit and on-demand riders ride in the same vehicle at the same time. So a trip may involve picking up a paratransit rider, followed by an on-demand rider. The paratransit rider would be dropped off to their final destination, while the on-demand rider may be dropped off at the nearest transit hub in order to transfer to conventional transit. Next slide. 
So commingling paratransit and on-demand services has been used by smaller transit operations to explore cost savings opportunities during periods of very low ridership and paratransit and on-demand during COVID in particular. So in response to the pandemic, some transit agencies converted some or all of their conventional service to on-demand in order to respond to very low ridership. So at the same time, they were seeing a drop in paratransit ridership and these services were operating in the same geographical area. Co-mingling was seen as a way to combine services in a time of low demand. In Edmonton, our context is really different. So we have strong and growing ridership on both DATS and on-demand transit, and they each have distinct differences in their service design. So I'll explain a few different um, aspects of that. So the first is about service standards. So DATS, or paratransit service, is a door-to-door -door transportation service offered citywide for those with physical and cognitive disabilities who are unable to use conventional transit. On-demand transit is only offered in certain areas of the city in specific zones and is meant to be a first kilometer, last kilometer connection uh, to connect to regular transit service. DATS riders can also book trips multiple days in advance, whereas on-demand transit is meant to be booked on a trip-by-trip -trip basis within an hour of the travel time. The second difference is about technology. So DATS and on-demand transit use different technology systems that are separate from one another. The third is related to fleet. So there are differences in the types of vehicles used for DATS and on-demand transit. So on-demand vehicles can accommodate fewer wheelchairs than DATS vehicles, as an example. And pre-booking DATS trips allows us to schedule DATS vehicles based on capacity to safely accommodate all of the equipment needed. The fourth difference relates to our workforce. So DATS uses in-house DATS operators uh, as well as contracted service through contracts with multiple different service providers, which helps us respond to any fluctuations in demand. Whereas on-demand transit service is delivered through a contracted service with a single provider. And lastly, it relates to transit faring. So DATS riders require uh, to have cash fare or a valid transfer ticket or pass as proof of payment upon boarding the vehicle. On-demand transit riders pay the fare when they get um, to the transit hub. There would be challenges with commingling DATS and on-demand transit riders in the same trip due to some of those differences, and it may impact rider perceptions. Next slide. So our short to medium term next steps are focused on implementing further improvements to both DATS and on-demand transit. For DATS, a multi-year service enhancement plan was approved in 2019 that had several actions to improve the DATS experience for riders and implement a more flexible and cost-effective model. Since then, we've implemented the majority of the action items and have improved flexibility, scheduling processes, and rider booking and wait times. We've seen an increase in DATS overall satisfaction levels from 90% in 2020 to 93% last year. We'll be implementing additional measures this year and next, which includes rolling out a new online DATS trip booking system, implementing scheduling process changes based on distance-based rides, making process changes to allow riders to book trips based on desired drop-off times, and lastly, exploring technology solutions for integrating DATS and conventional service in our trip planning. For on-demand transit, rider satisfaction is also high, which is great. In 2023, the average on-demand uh, in-app ratings were at 4.7 out of 5. In the next year, we're making additional improvements, which includes the ongoing continuous implementation of the growth funded through the four-year budget cycle, improving rider wait times and implementing more efficient fleet utilization, analyzing how to improve trips related to school service for youth, and with the recent budget decision to grow a conventional bus service, we've been able to transition a neighborhood uh, to conventional from on-demand, which will help improve wait times and may support adding on-demand to some neighborhoods that don't have service today. Next slide. So overall, we are committed to continuous improvement for our riders. And we have ongoing work uh, to further improve DATS as well as on-demand transit. We appreciated the opportunity to do this research and explore the concept of commingling, and my colleagues and I are happy to answer any questions that you might have. Excellent. Thank you very much for that presentation. Um, 
I've selected the item. Um, so I'll, I'll maybe start. And I, I do have a, a motion that I'll put on, I think, just towards the end of my, my time. So first of all, really appreciate the report. Um, I found it very thorough. A uh, point of order. Yeah. Uh, should we do speakers? Oh, no, there's no speakers. Sorry. No, that's OK. That's OK. I also confused myself on that, too. Um, uh, yeah, so, you know, I thought the report did a very clear job of explaining the conditions where commingling has been has been introduced. And it seems that those conditions don't don't fully exist here. We have very high uh, ridership on on both our on demand and our paratransit. Is that correct? That's correct. Great. Um, I, you know, also really appreciated some of the details um, that were given. I mean, it's it's incredible, you know, 17,000 rides per week with that's 12,000 per week for on demand. Um, and what I found interesting sort of looking at these two services is just sort of how, you know, something that's important for me is that we're ensuring um, sort of equal, equal service for all users. Um, something that stood out to me just in terms of some of the differences was, um, as someone who's not always very organized, you know, a, a, a challenge I see with that is the need for sort of that pre-booking, you know, on demand is I think within the hours, uh, sort of flexibility. Um, and that's, that's not always available for, for folks using DATS. So just wondering if there's some work, um, that, you know, could potentially, potentially look, um, to improve that, that service experience. Yeah, I think the quick answer is yes. We are interested in exploring that and agree with you in terms of independence, in terms of uh, flexibility. And I'll just see if Paul, our manager for paratransit, wants to add more. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, I mean, the nature of our, our service, it is important to to have the pre-booked aspect um, to, you know, ensure that we're, we're coordinating to allow for things like programs and group trips and allowing people to plan things like subscriptions for, you know, work or school and things like that. So um, that is an important aspect, but definitely there could be opportunities uh, to looking at adding some flexibility to our service. Currently, we do offer people the ability to um, request trips on, on the day of service. Uh, but they're not always guaranteed. So our service right now is um, funded and structured to kind of guarantee the pre-booked service and then provide same-day service where it's available. Um, so looking at uh, different ways to work with our, our contracted service and our um, uh, city um, uh, run service uh, to provide more flexibility um, could involve things like looking at how we work with taxis or their potential partnership there. Um, we'd have to look at some technology integration opportunities, but um, definitely something that could be explored moving forward. Certainly there's some precedent with other transit agencies to provide that type of service. Great, great. Well, I, I Maybe we'll come around for a second round and, and uh, put a motion on the floor, which I hope helps get to that, but really appreciate the openness for it, to it and also also the work that's already underway uh, to build that flexibility. Just maybe two two last questions. Do we have any sense? So, the, so the, my only hesitation around the, the commingling, which was a lingering question for me, was just, do we have any feedback from, from users of DATS in terms of what what they may prefer from a from a feeling of inclusivity um, has has that been explored at all with some of the ridership? So I think overall we provide a lot of um, support and travel training. We have an accessibility coordinator uh, who can do individualized kind of trip plans and travel plans. Wow. Really want to support those who can perhaps have a blended model between conventional solutions and paratransit solutions. Um, you know, I think that's been our focus is to provide that individualized support. Um, I think the trade-offs or the challenges with uh, the co-mingling would outweigh, you know, any potential benefit for uh, those who might have an interest. I think we can actually work with them to give them more opportunities, uh, looking at the totality of the conventional service. Right. Great. Thank you for that. Last question, just a small operating. Uh, I was I was interested to learn that on-demand users don't have to pay when they board the on-demand bus. They pay at the transit center. Do we have any sense? Are we ever losing revenue when someone's destination is the transit center? 
So that was part of the service design conversations when we set this up. So it's quite an investment to add fair collection to the on-demand service. And the trade-off that we considered is there might be occasional times when people are doing that, getting to the hub. From a broad city plan kind of perspective, we think about integration with active modes of transportation. You know, there might be valid ways that people are traveling once they get to the hub that we want to encourage anyway. Uh, so it was a conscious kind of intentional decision by council not to invest the additional um, kind of funds towards adding that fair collection to the on-demand service uh, option. Great. Great. Thank you. That makes a lot of sense. and appreciate that the thoughtfulness uh, that went into it. I'll go next to Councillor Tang. Great. Thank you very much for this report. Um, I mean, I um, I mean, I think those the the challenges for commingling are, um, you know, I absolutely I can I can see that. Um, I guess uh, wondering in the preparation for this report, any specific conversations with the accessibility co committee? Yeah, I'll open it up to the team to weigh in uh, on the process. I know Sarah's on the line and she has members of her team. Yeah, uh, thank you, Council. I could speak to that. So we did meet with the Accessibility Advisory Committee and also with ETSAB, the Transit System Advisory Board, to share with them essentially what we shared with you today in the report. Um, and some of their comments are shared in the report, um, including, um, you know, how accessibility works on the on-demand vehicle, so understanding how securement works, um, and pieces around arrival time. Some of the things we're hearing actually through our rider survey, so we do an annual DATS rider survey as well. And so we heard some of the similar pieces around um, uh, wait times and arrival times, which is part of that action plan and it's been a focus for this year, working on the arrival time piece. Yeah, that's great, thank you. Yeah, I mean, I, mean, I think, um... You know, comments I also often hear about isn't isn't necessarily like so tactical like co mingling, but more just wanting better service delivery in particular when it comes to dads. Um, I guess uh, you know in your next sec in your next step section you talk about you know we'll try to be as efficient as possible, um, and I heard. I think Paul mentioned, you know, technology integration, that kind of stuff. Um, I guess how will you measure whether you are it's, this is more efficient than previously? Yeah, so we have a number of different KPIs and measures that we track uh, for paratransit service. So we look at accommodation rates, we look at the time, um, kind of the percent of trips that we've accommodated, we look at satisfaction from the DATS users. There's a suite of uh, measures that we use, so those would be uh, part of this assessment. Um, and then we're continually through the annual service plan, taking a look at the roll-up of all of our KPIs as well. So uh, definitely have an evaluation mind. Uh, when it comes to this stuff. Yeah, and I know, Sarah, you just mentioned there, you know, there, there is an end of a year's uh, user or ridership experience. One thing I, um, I I always thought was very, very cool about On Demand is that people can provide real-time feedback when they do plan their trip. You know, is that something that we can kind of integrate uh, for, for DAS users so that they can kind of provide real-time feedback? Yeah, I think we can take that away for sure. Uh, we've been sharpening our pencils in terms of a similar approach for our rider satisfaction measurement between DATS and conventional service. So I think this is a nice evolution. We could take that away and look at that just-in-time feedback that we get on on-demand. Can we apply that same approach uh, for paratransit? I think that's a great idea. And then I'm wondering, uh, also in the next step section, there's a appointment of about subscription, okay. what does that mean? So in terms of on-demand service, we heard loud and clear from parents and I live in an on-demand zone and I share the feedback, frustrations about if our kids need to use the on-demand service to get to the hub in order to get to school, why can't we just book those trips in advance? Why can't we just you know, book, let's say five days worth at a time? Um, so if it's in that context, uh, it's exploring that with the on-demand provider. Okay, what would you, uh, I had interpreted that as subscription uh, also for DATS. Would that be part of that? Yeah, so Paul, do you want to weigh in, Paul? Because you currently offer subscription options for DATS. Okay. Gotcha. Yeah, yeah. DATS yeah. currently offers subscriptions. So what, what that means is just basically um, you set up a kind of a one-time series of trips. So if you have to go to, to and from work or school, you know, Monday through Friday, um, and it's yeah. recurring, you just set up that, that trip one time so you don't have to continually book it. 
Gotcha. So there's really lots of lessons learned on both systems that maybe the other can really use to improve service for, for all users. Um, sure. And then uh, let me see if I can squeeze in one more. Um, and then just for the work plan, uh, what is your timeline for the work plan? Yeah, so it was originally designed as a three-year action plan in 2019, and we all know what happened in 2020, yes. so it slowed us down. Uh, Paul's team has been really great at closing off the vast majority of the items. So these remainder uh, items that are on the list, we're looking at probably like a 12-month time frame uh, to get those concluded, uh, but it's ongoing continuous improvement. So that's not to say, you know, we check those off and then, okay, we're done. Uh, we're always incorporating feedback and looking at how to improve the service. Awesome. Thank you so much. That's all for me. Thanks, Councillor Tang. Councillor, oh, Mayor Sohi, over to you. Yeah, thank you so much for the report, uh, Kerry. I, uh, what I heard you say that uh, the investments that we are making in public transit are freeing up some resources on the on-demand side that uh, that then you're deploying them into into newer communities where on-demand did not exist before. So it's an option. So part of Edgemont on the southwest side of the city transitioned to a new conventional transit route. So it's a success story. Ridership was high enough. We could transition them from on-demand service to conventional service. So the amount of hours that were being used in on-demand can get redeployed. So we know that wait times have been high. So we want to invest those vehicles to lower wait times. But depending how that goes, we might yeah. have enough hours that we could look at another neighborhood uh, added to a, an existing zone. Yeah. One thing that I would appreciate, I know a little, little off topic, it's maybe not as top, off topic, uh, uh, Chair Stevenson, but I want to raise this and maybe get some information from Kerry in the form of a memo. Uh, I don't think the investments this council has made in public transit are put in a, in a kind of a package, one place, right? Uh, to, to communicate, for example, correct me if I'm wrong, like we made on-demand transit permanent, right? Correct. And we also added some off-peak service in the, in the first four-year budget that we approved. Correct, and you grew on-demand service by 25% in addition oh, to the off-peak hours. Okay. That was all done together. That's three things, then yeah. we also, uh, and reallocated, uh, I mean, wasn't reallocation because uh, there was no funding attached, but the Valley Line, Southeast Valley Line hours. That's right. Uh, additional service because of that. Then we also uh, buying some buses and that buses will allow us to increase additional service. That's correct. Hours. And then we have made significant safety investments to uh, encourage more people to use. But I would like i don't have to i hope don't have to make a motion around this right maybe you can send us a memo kind of itemizing all the investments that this call to yeah has made right to improve public transit and expand public transit that will be helpful from a communications point of view and also the dollar value to it as well as the service of our hours of service that we would see increase and number of communities benefiting. Particularly, for example, I would, one thing that I worried about was that if we did not make on-demand permanent, number of communities would have lost service, right? Absolutely. It was integrated into the bus network redesign. Um, so it's quite, quite a high number of communities for that first kilometer, last kilometer solution. Uh, that have an on-demand design. We would love to do this list for for all of you. Uh, I don't think it'll take long to do it. Um, and we're just very grateful for all of the investments. And we can show capital as well as operating uh, in yeah. that list. Yeah, please. I'm, I'm more interested in uh, uh, non-LRT investments. Like I think LRT investments are understood. They're very big, right? But I think uh, on the bus side, I would like to understand that. For sure. We can take that away. Okay. Thank you so much. Really appreciate for uh, uh, for your for your work. Thank you, Mayor Sohi. Councillor Wright. 
Thank you very much. Um, yeah, that would be a great summary to have. I know out here in Ward Spomatappy, we finally have on-demand service as a result of, of what we've been doing in council. So that would be wonderful to have. Um, and thank you for this report too. I know it, it sort of came up through the, the vehicle for hire uh, discussions. Um, you know, it's a, a different way to, to explore different service options. So um, and I thought that was kind of a, an interesting concept then. I, I'm just wondering um, when Paul was speaking about the subscriptions, does that is that the same as the DATS online booking? So, like, is that in place now? Do you want to go ahead, Paul? Sure. Uh, no, subscriptions are a type of trip booking that we've we've had in place for for quite a long time. Um, the uh, online booking upgrade would be um, uh, an upgrade to our online booking tool to allow people to more easily book their trips via that option, as well as through our uh, call center. Okay, so and I think the report says it was that was going to take place in 2024. Do you have a more specific timeline in 2024 for that? Um, we're just looking uh, at a kickoff meeting on that project. So we have um, a project manager uh, now assigned to that and a statement of work in place. So uh, kind of in the preliminary planning phases, but expected to be completed sometime in 2024. Okay, great. Okay. And then would that also provide... I don't know, the opportunity like sort of for, for after hours service, um, you know, if somebody was getting a pickup at seven o'clock in the evening, but um, I think the the DATS customer service is, is closed at that time. And if they've missed their scheduled pickup, is, is there any way to, to help accommodate that? Um, we we can accommodate um, trip requests um, throughout the, the DATS operating hours. Um, so, uh, uh, like that can be made, uh, through the online booking system as well as through the call center. When our call center, um, is at, it's after hours, those calls go to dispatch. So, um, people can currently make requests if they want a same day trip, or maybe if a pickup was missed or something like that, we help folks out, uh, quite frequently in those types of situations. Um, but there are limitations to, to the service hours. Um, so that typically goes, um, from around, you know, six, seven in the morning to, to around midnight, depending on the day of the week. Okay. So people can still access dispatch. They can, yes. Okay, okay. And is that just automatically redirected when they call through to DATS or? Okay. Correct. All right, awesome. Um, and then I'm just also wondering, um, I, th I think there's um, sort of maybe one of the barriers or challenges to, to co-mingling would be that there's different training requirements for the drivers. Is that right? From on-demand compared to DATS? So DATS would definitely have more in-depth training for persons with disabilities. Um, so I think that's fair. I think that's a fair assessment. But but um, on demand still has um, still has training. They do. Yeah. Okay. Okay. They do. Just, DATS yeah. is more like how to how to. Um, secure the wheelchair and things like that. Would a that wider be... range of um, disabilities and supports provided through DATS. On demand has some accessibility training, uh, but it wouldn't be as in depth. Okay. Okay. Um, I think that's all. Very comprehensive report. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Wright. Councillor Tang? No? No, you go first. Okay, thanks. Um, I, I'm just going to put a motion on the floor um, so that administration provide a report outlining options to improve the rider experience for a paratransit dedicated accessible transit service, DATS, including the pickup window for trips and late night travel with a due date of September 17, 2024, Urban Planning Committee meeting. So just very briefly to introduce this, um, you know, I'm so encouraged by the work that's already underway. Uh, the steps that were outlined in the action plan are really excellent. Um, I love seeing uh, the option to book by arrival time. That that just helps so much in terms of functionality of people getting around. Um, opening up the um, uh, option for um, day of requests, recognizing that they're not currently guaranteed. So these are all really positive steps. Um, and this motion is really just encouraged, uh, intended to encourage those steps to continue to be taken. Um, you know, a lot of this is informed by 
uh, what I hear from feedback of different constituents and also, you know, witnessing event with someone who, you know, was, was leading an event in the community. Um, the event ran late. She missed her pickup window and, you know, had very few options to, to get home at that point. So I really, really appreciate the team being willing to take this on and explore this further. I'm hopeful that, um, or I, I anticipate in September that this may come with a budget ask that, that looks at how we expand that service to enhance it. I don't think we should shy away from that. Um, I'm really excited by the investment that we're making as council into transit. And I want to ensure that all users of our transit system are benefiting from that, that investment equally. So happy to take any questions on this. Um, and again, thank you to administration for working with me on this motion. Uh, Councillor Tang, to you. Okay, um, no questions on the motion. I think it's a great motion. Um, I have uh, one lingering question that may be a little bit off topic, but just following the thought of Mayor Sohi earlier, um, as we start to kind of revisit some of the resourcing uh, and on demand, um, like how do how do more communities and on the south side um, <laughs> get more on on demand? I think that's probably what we're all thinking. Um, but I guess are you going to be then also looking at kind of the existing on-demand services and the level of usage and all the other factors, would you be doing a little bit of resh like reshuffling of that? Yeah, so thanks for the question. We monitor um, kind of the performance of on-demand in each zone. So we're closely looking at utilization, looking at wait times, et cetera. Um, so there's that continuous, and we have the five times a year we do the schedule changes. That's our chance to do some rejigging uh, from an efficiency perspective. Um, in terms of, I think what I'm hearing you say is there may be new neighborhoods not currently connected to conventional service, not connected through on-demand, who need some transit support. So we'd love to talk that through. Um, maybe we can book some time to better understand those needs. Um, yeah. Yes, yeah. I, would, I would appreciate that. Okay. Um, just so I can better understand too, kind of the, the various public transportation options. Um, yeah, exactly. And I, mean, I imagine all, all council members will be interested in- And in how we connect neighborhoods to hubs because right. with our land use decisions, right? We have a very like big geographical area. <laughs> yeah, totally. um, so we have to do that analysis, but happy to chat with whoever um, you want to connect us with and we can explore that. Thank you. Um, and actually, maybe I do have a question on this, uh, maybe to administration, you know, thinking about sort of the earlier theme in that previous discussion about integrated, you know, collaborative across departmental, that kind of stuff. Um, really, to me, you know, this conversation, as Councillor Wright had mentioned, really is tied to some of pre other conversations around vehicle for hire, because we are trying to improve the transportation options for people with disabilities overall. Um, as you kind of do this, do this work here, outline the report, would you be having those conversations with colleagues in UPE? We sure would. So we actually work really closely with the vehicle for hire area. Uh, so Paul is in touch with them regularly and vice versa. Um, and when Paul and I discussed this motion, that's exactly what came to mind is, especially for that late night travel part, like how do we set that up for success uh, to help riders? When I heard the story that Councillor Stevenson shared, like it's heartbreaking to think someone doesn't have options and they're stranded just because the event ran late. Um, so for sure, we'll have those integrated conversations and come, come up with some options. Options, I think for council. Yeah, absolutely. And maybe I just, if I can just take the last couple of minutes just to speak to it very briefly. You know, I think this is a really great way forward. Uh, when I, you know, when this report was first published like a couple months ago, I I wasn't sure actually what the way forward would be. And so I really appreciate Councillor Stevenson for putting this forward. I think that the more we can kind of keep the conversation around uh, service delivery, better improved service delivery for uh, people with, with disabilities and accessible needs, I think uh, we, you know, we keep it top of mind. Um, I think the better. Um, and I think I can't, I'm, I'm not, I'm also being very mindful of just the overall outcome that we're trying to achieve. You know, again, that theme of focus on outcome. The outcome is that we want uh, people to have transportation options. I think those stories that Councillor Stevenson mentioned isn't unique. In fact, you know, I, I hear frequently um, 
folks with disabilities also, you know, go out to just and live their lives. And but they're so limited because of um, um, what is available to them. And I think the more we can do to um, provide people with those options and and freedom to kind of live their lives, um, I I very much appreciate it. So thank you, uh, and I look forward to when this uh, the, this conversation returns. Thank you for those words, Councillor Tang. I think uh, happy to move into um, speaking. I understand Councillor Rutherford, you're on the board to speak. And if anyone else would like to, please sign up. Thank you. I'm guessing I can go ahead. Thanks. Um, so I, I really appreciate this, this motion too. Uh, I think while we have done a lot of progress since the 2019 report, in the conversations, I echo what Councillor Stevenson and Councillor Tang say. Uh, the conversations I've had, I, I, I'm actually quite disheartened to hear how challenging it can be sometimes. I was on the phone just this past week with a constituent in the ward I represent who has cerebral palsy, and they have to book to go grocery shopping on a Sunday by Thursday afternoon. And they have to, the time slot wasn't available for their preferred return. So they have to wait around the shopping complex for another hour and a half before their their bus can pick them up. Um, they also told me about times where, you know, they're visiting their 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 mother at a, a home and the pickups came early and uh, beyond before the window, and so they'd have to leave leave their their scheduled visit early because the driver had arrived early. Um, they also told me about times where they've had to take the conventional bus because of uh, not being able to get a dad's bus and getting stuck in crosswalks in winter and how embarrassing and undignified that is. And so I think that this is a great motion by Councillor Stevenson to continue pushing for better for dads. I, I think we need to make sure that you know, we talk about public transit and it's great that we have on demand and it's great that we have conventional service that we're investing in and improving in. Uh, we can't leave anybody behind. And I think there's still so much more room to improve this service for the folks that need it the most. So thank you, Councillor Stevenson, for putting this motion forward. And I completely uh, will be supporting it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, to my colleagues for their words. And just in closing, want want to emphasize that uh, I I did not have to twist any arms for this motion. I I heard very enthusiastic um, desire and and um, an understanding from from our DATS team. Uh, again, huge improvements have been made. It, it's great that that's um, continuing to happen um, and really appreciate the enthusiasm with which the, the team embraced this and it makes me very hopeful for the work coming forward. And, uh, you know, what I'm hearing today from my colleagues also makes me feel really encouraged about, about what we can achieve together. Uh, so I look forward to bringing forward a, a bold plan and I hope that we can get behind you to support moving that forward as well. So with that, I will ask you all to vote. Yes. Thank you, Councillor Cartmel. We'll record you as a yes. Just waiting on one vote. We have all the votes. Please display the vote. That's carried. Excellent. Thank you. So just as a bit of amenda, agenda management, um, I'm hoping that we can get through the presentation for item 7.1 and have time for our speaker to speak before we get to noon. So we may need to extend slightly just to, to finish hearing from our speaker. People are comfortable with that. Um, uh, but without further delay, I'll turn it over to administration for the presentation on 7.1. Thank you. Uh, with me today again is Carrie Hot McDonald and Daniel uh, Vrend from ETS. Uh, we're here today to talk about our information report about exploring options for cost sharing a direct downtown to airport bus route. Uh, the airport is a major driver of economic prosperity in our region. Of course, uh, creating employment opportunities, attracting attracting investment, uh, facilitating trade, and and really encouraging tourism of our great city. 
So uh, we met with some key stakeholders to explore the motion, and we'll now pass it over to Daniel to present our findings. Thanks, Eddie. Um, the council asked administration to review opportunities um, for cost sharing with with stakeholders, and to yeah, and to review options for for routing as well. Um, benefits of uh, direct downtown to airport connection include um, strategic connection. It's featured in the city plan and provincial ministerial mandate letters. It's important to connect regionally important employment and travel mode at the airport and provide an additional travel option into the city from southern districts areas south of Edmonton. Um, may help to track conference in, conferences and events as a result of increased connectivity between downtown and the airport would be seen as a benefit, particularly to the hospitality industry near the stops. Um, if we can go to slide, uh, slide three there. And then slide four, conceptual route was shown in attachment one, connecting similar points as the airport connector shown in the mass transit plan. We've costed out these options based on service levels that we heard from stakeholders. Option one would represent the bare minimum service level, which is similar in frequency to the current 747, which connects the airport and Sentry Place Transit Center. Option two represents a service level more in line with stakeholder feedback as to what the minimum is, 30 minute service at all times. Based on what we have heard from stakeholders, they are supportive of enhanced transit service, but are not able to fund any portion of the service. We've heard that good connection to the airport can be a source of pride, enhances our climate goals, can support the hotel industry, and may help attract events. Slide five, administration outlined the need for 260,000 annual uh, hours for transit service to meet local needs in August of 2023 to address service standards. Through the fall SOBA, Council has funded 160,000 of those. Approximately 70,000 of those will start this year. Um, our next steps um, will include staying abreast of opportunities to partner on service to the airport with the Downtown Business Association, Hotel Association, as well in, as, well as continuing to partner with other orders of government as they develop their plans. Um, so with that, I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you very much uh, for the presentation. We'll go now to our speaker, uh, Lexi McFarlane. Are you here? Can confirm I'm here. All right. Well, it's over to you. Uh, you have five minutes and um, happy for you to take it away. All right. So first of all, I'd like to start by saying that the uh, bus route is definitely a great idea. And regardless of where my brief presentation goes, I absolutely support the airport to downtown route in general in whatever form it takes. It's going to be very vital to the success of Edmonton's future. Um, so just briefly, though, I want to pitch an alternative that I've studied immensely over the past couple of years. We go to the next slide. Um, basically, what I've been looking at is the unique infrastructure of South Edmonton and the fact that there's an opportunity for us to do something that would allow us to overcome the shortcomings that bus route may face. Uh, notably, traffic, always uh, traffic in downtown can be uh, dicey at best and like downright gridlock at worst. So what I was looking at is something that there's been precedent set before when the original LRT was constructed. It was constructed along uh, Canadian National right of way. And what I've looked at is the Canadian Pacific right of way that exists in South Edmonton from about Old Strathcona or just south of it out towards Airport Road. So in potentially building a rail line, not necessarily right away, but at some point in the near future, this would be a lot more rapid transit towards downtown Edmonton would skip the traffic hurdle. Uh, if we want to go to the next slide. Uh, so the advantage as well, beyond skipping 
the uh, traffic gridlock that may arise is that this could not only serve airports downtown, but have room for stations at other uh, key points along the way, notably the communities of Ellerslie, Cavanaugh, and Allard. Uh, South Edmonton Common is a huge destination, as is the premium outlet collection. And even Old Stracona White Avenue, where there's still a lot of nightlife. I've been through there multiple times in the past couple months, and it's such a vibrant area that there's only buses there, and that still boggles my mind that we aren't uh, potentially considering some form of rail. So there's a lot of opportunity beyond just the airport, but the airport obviously is the major driver for this route. Uh, if we want to go to the next slide. So the economic loss aspect, obviously, we wouldn't have to spend a whole lot of resources to build this. It would be more of a negotiation, obviously, to be able to use the Canadian Pacific right away. But basically, outside of both endpoints of the line, it would be a matter of just laying down track and building stations that are just simple, focused on functionality, getting people to those destinations. And it's an opportunity not a lot of cities really have to build such a simple functional method of uh, rail transportation from their airport into their downtown. And just continue on the next slide is that, of course, bypass traffic almost entirely. I think the only grade level crossing I've seen would be South Edmonton Common. And then this would allow for a full length train, not just simple bus, which allows for a lot more space for like luggage or people going to grocery stores. Uh, the infrastructure on the next slide, the only piece of construction I see would just be a parallel bridge to the Walterdale on its uh, west side and then tunnels to kind of link from the bridge into Old Stracona as well as from the QE2 where the rail line is underground to the airport terminal itself. And the final slide, uh, this is just hypothesizing because I've tried to follow Toronto as best as I can as an example. Uh, obviously, they recently sold their decommissioned Scarborough RT cars to Detroit to help expand and extend their people mover service. And their uh, T1 cars that run on the line too, the newer ones of those will not even be 30 years old by the time they're put out of service. Uh, they may still have some very usable life left in them if we do regular state of good repair and even some minor life extension details that would help us get the line started on a much more economic footnote. So it's just something I wanted to present to consider and I'd be happy to take questions on this and I hope that this at least gets considered but regardless I support very strongly airport to downtown connections. Great, great. Well, thank you so much for joining us this morning. I uh, really appreciate the, the thought that's gone into this. Um, I'll just look to the board to see if any of my, my colleagues have specific questions. Again, I think your presentation was quite comprehensive, so um, not sure that there, there will be any more detailed questions. Is that a moment? All right. Well, thank you again so much for joining us. I, I uh, yeah, appreciate the inspiration and so, certainly something that I think, uh, you know, we're all, all passionate about as well in terms of that connectivity. So thank you very much. Cool. Um, with unanimous consent from my colleagues, I'd just like to move uh, that we extend orders to finish this item. Um, I know that I have some questions, so I will just jump right into that. I'm hoping that uh, we won't go too many minutes over noon. Uh, thank you very much for the report. Um, very, very helpful to have those options. Uh, the, the capital cost certainly came as a bit of a, a bit of a, a blow in terms of the feasibility of exploring this right now. Um, but appreciate knowing that that's, that is indeed the case of what we would need to do. Um, so just to clarify, we would potentially have capacity in the satellite garage in terms of space, but we just don't have any physical buses. Yeah, so this would be growth, uh, so net new, uh, and require the purchasing of the buses. If council decided to prioritize this, um, you know, we we didn't find any interest in co-funding it, mm -hmm. um, but that satellite facility 
uh, during the budget process. So we can accommodate up to 40 buses and we funded 20. So there's still okay. half available. Uh, okay. so that was the rationale for including that. And then the report that's coming back on March 19th, um, was this route sort of in the mix in terms of balancing priorities? Um, unfortunately, it isn't, and I'll explain why. So 260,000 service hours are the gap to service standards as of last year. Right. Um, the investments, we're very grateful for them, uh, including the 20 buses in the satellite facility, bring us halfway there. So right. we still have a significant amount of service hours that we're missing from the Edmonton network to meet our service standards for riders. So our recommendation would be, um, you know, to try to continue to stay on that path of closing that gap. However, we obviously follow your direction. If council wanted to prioritize this, um, we can entertain that. Um, but our focus has been on closing that 260,000 hour gap that we have. Yeah, no, I think I think that that's really helpful context that this, these aren't just sort of free new hours that we have to play with. They are they are filling a very distinct gap that, that already exists. And this route is potentially sort of, you know, we don't have a service standard that we're failing to meet when it comes to connectivity to the airport. So that, that helps contextualize, I appreciate that. Um, just in terms of that, that capital requirement, you know, in the, in the future, would it be possible to potentially look at an on-demand model where, where we're, we're able to use other fleets um, to, to avoid that upfront capital cost? Yeah, I mean, I think we can explore all options for sure. Um, so that's something that could be entertained. Um, I'm not sure that it would fit within the existing contract, but that, those are details. Yes, <laughs> my short answer is yes, we could explore alternatives. Yeah. Well, and I think, I think that, you know, I think the next conversation I need to have as well is with some of our, our partners, um, with the DBA, with uh, destination marketing with Explore Edmonton, just again, to really dig into the value proposition that they have. Um, would there be any impediment, for example, um, I, I'm just thinking, because again, we do we do have transit connections to the airport uh, through Century Park. It does include, you know, one transfer. Um, but if those groups were interested in having, let's say, navigators at Century Park uh, during specific conferences, would there be any impediments to that happening? Is that something ETS would be supportive of? Yeah, so we actually worked with them before. So we set up um, kind of like a show your badge program uh, to support events that were coordinated through um, through them to just provide that activation support and integration with us. Happy to continue you know, to provide those opportunities. We know the service levels aren't quite hitting it on the 747. We have very, very high usage and demand. So we're talking to our regional partners. It's a regional route funded by uh, you know, not just Edmonton. So we're exploring how we might address better service uh, on the existing route as well. So that's all part of this kind of conversation. Okay. Okay, great. Well, again, thank you very much. This report gave us, I feel, the information we needed to make an informed decision. So um, I'm happy to move receipt of information. So I'll, I'll put on the floor that the February 6, 2024 City Operations Report, CO 01632, be received for information. Um, not seeing anyone else up there, I may open and close with a, a few brief remarks. Um, just to give it a beat in case anyone has a burning desire to speak. Uh, yeah, I just want to say again, thank you so much for the, the work that went into this. The analysis was really comprehensive. And as I say, you know, gave us the, the full picture and the, the answers that I think we need to make a decision. Uh, you know, while, while I think there are some obstacles to moving forward right now, and specifically around the capital investment that's required, I do think this is an idea that I want to keep alive um, and continue to explore through different partnership models and, and different delivery service delivery models. Um, so all that to say that this is a great starting point. I don't think the conversation is over at this point. Um, and I, I look forward to continue exploring different ways of delivering this uh, in the future. So I think that could be my closing um, rather than my opening. If there's no one else to speak and I'll just ask everyone to vote, please. Yes. Thank you, Councillor Carmel. We'll record you as a yes. We have all the votes. Please display the vote. And that's carried.
Wonderful. Well, um, I don't believe we have responses to councillor inquiries, private reports, no motions pending. Any notices of motion or motions without customary notice? Seeing none, I will declare this meeting adjourned. Thank you, everyone. Thank you to our team uh, for the, the virtual uh, management today. And thank you all for joining. Have a great rest of the afternoon.